those of you watching at home, we just exited out of executive session and we're now returning to our regular meeting. And I would invite you all to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And just before I turn this over to Dr. McLeod for the reorganization of the school committee portion of our meeting, I just wanted to welcome Nancy Cavanaugh as our newest school committee member who was just elected to the position last week. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. McLeod. Thank you. So it is my uh, responsibility to seek nominations um, for the position of chair of the school committee. So I open the floor for nominations for that. I would like to nominate Lori. Chair. Okay. Uh, so we're not gonna take we, a second. Oh. Although last year we did, yeah. so um, thank you. I'm, I'm now um, looking to see if there are other nominations to the role. Seeing none, um, I will still take a roll call. <laughs> okay. Roll call vote, <laughs> thank you. Um, Ms. Nickerson. Yes. <laughs> you That's accept? Good. It's a, accept. It's a yes. fair first question. Ms. Knight? <laughs> yes. Ms. Knight. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Ms. Cavanaugh? Yes. And Ms. Birchman? Yes. And so that's it. It's official. You are the chair. I am going to turn it over to you for the purpose of nominations for the vice chair. Thank you. Um, so at this time, we would seek nominations for the position of vice chair. So I'd like to nominate Kelly Knight for vice chair. Okay. Are there any other nominations for the position? I guess not. That's passed. Okay. Um, so I guess we're ready for a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Birchman? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ms. Cavanaugh? Yes. Ms. Gaz yes. Mr. Graziano? Ms. Knight? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. And it's unanimous and so carries. So at this time, do I have to change tiers? You don't even have to change tiers. No, I guess not. That. Um, and so we will move on to the recognitions portion of our meeting, which doc, uh, Dr. McLeod. Thank you. Um, if Deb and Grilly, if you could come on up and um, sit over here for, for just a minute. We've been waiting for months to have all of, all of you come uh, to recognize you because there's just so many things to recognize. Um, the students that are here tonight have achieved awards at the national, state, and regional levels. And international. And international, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess I wanted to begin by recognizing you for your leadership, for your ongoing leadership, and for providing these opportunities for our students. Uh, I know that you lead it with such enthusiasm. Um, and so thank you. When we were initially going to recognize students um, back in March for the Worcester Regional Science and Engineering Fair, um, we kind of talked about the fact that wouldn't it be better to wait until till, um, everything was complete. So I think um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to you to recognize um, the students that are here today because you know them so well. Um, thank you. Uh, let's start with Vinny and Callie. You want to come on up? So Vinny and Callie uh, participated at the regional fair and the state fair this year. This is their second time doing projects. Do you want to tell people what you did for your research? Okay, um, well what I did is I wanted to see how different genres of music can affect someone's visual spatial memory. And visual spatial memory is just um, knowing the location of objects and their um, kind of temporal distance between others. My project this year uh, revolved around using Daphnia Magna as a bioassay tool to monitor soil toxicity. Um, my project is an example of a bioassay. Basically what that means is that I take an organism and I put them into different environments that they're not accustomed to and I want to see how they react. So the organism that I used was Daphnia Magna. They're a freshwater crustacean. Um, you can find them in local ponds, streams, or any type of freshwater. And what I did is I placed these Daphnia into six different locations all around the Metro West region. 
and I wanted to see how many of them were viable when I started the experiment and when I had ended the experiment. So my results, um, I concluded that there were two samples where I got um, the Daphnia. They were dying at, a di at an excessive rate, um, far more, far unusual than the other samples. And I concluded that this was not due to chance. There was definitely something in these soils that was causing these Daphnia to die. And there are certain toxins that Daphnia and other type of aquatic animals can't react to. So that's basically in a nutshell what my project was. Um, some further research that I would like to do is that I'd like to find the exact toxins that are located in the soil and I'd like to see what exactly is causing these Daphnia to die at such a high rate and what can we do to help our environment and make these soils um, more safer for certain types of animals that um, live there. And are you a senior? No, I'm a sophomore. <laughs> oh, so we're going to be hearing lots more from you, I can tell. And what are you, Callie, right? Yeah. Are you a senior? No, I'm also a sophomore. Tell us your results about spatial reasoning and music <laughs> genre. Okay, well, I tested um, classical music, alternative. I tested some like video game music. Um, and then obviously classical music was significantly better than all the other ones. And that also played into the same findings from a different study that I also kind of latched or like kind of um, that inspired my research, which was the Mozart effect. And so I used that exact song piece as well. Wonderful. And, and so different. It's just fascinating, the range of, of work that you're, that you're doing with all the students. So thank you so much. Very thank well you. spoken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Parima and Brian. So Parima and Brian also went to the um, National Junior Science and Humanities Symposium in Ohio, actually presenting projects they did last year, as well as continuing to <laughs> do their presentations for the State Fair. Um, Brian got a third award at the State Fair, and um, Parima got a special Biogenius Award at the, um, the Regional Fair, and she's going to be doing that in June, right? Yeah. You're going to go to New York? Yep. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about it? Sure. So um, I actually worked with a partner on my project. My partner, unfortunately, could not be here today. But what we did basically was we tested on these molecules called supramolecular photosensitizers. And basically what they are is in the presence of sunlight, they get excited. And then they transfer their energy to this ground state molecular oxygen, exciting that to produce like this highly reactive oxygen. And then all the highly reactive oxygen can go to the bacteria and kill it. So we tested this molecule on three types of organisms, two bacteria and one fungi. And we tested on E. coli, E. cloacae, which is like a medical device contaminant in hospitals, and A. niger, which is a fungi that is a crop contaminant. And the results turned out that the supramolecular photosensitizer was effective against the E. coli and E. cloacae bacteria. However, it was ineffective against the fungi, which is a possible limitation of my methodation. And in addition for future research, I would like to figure out the minimum concentration of these sensitizers needed to kill off these bacteria. In addition, I would like to test in different light ranges. So for my testing, I tested using ambient light. And finally, I would like to test on other organisms and expand my research on MRSA as well as viruses, if possible. And Prima, what are your career goals? Career goals, I would like to major in biomedical engineering and be on the pre-medical track. <laughs> I think there's a good chance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to also add that you make me excited to think about all the energy just listening to you describe it all, so that's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, have we seen you before? Yes, I was here last year. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Tell us about this year's project. So my project this year was called um, Music Math, Does Music Follow a Ziffy in Distribution? And um, my project was based in this math theory called Ziff's Law. And I won't go into the specifics of what it is, but it's really cool because it fits into uh, many different random data sets that you would never think of. So like solar flare intensities and earthquake magnitudes and the number of times scientific papers are cited and then in the human body, gene expression and protein fold occurrence and the rate at which we forget information all fit into Ziff's law. So what I wanted to do was um, 
knowing that Ziff's law fits into all of these studies and all of these functions of the human body, um, I wanted to study music because I've been playing piano for nine years. And I wanted to see um, if music fits Ziff's law, it would explain why we like music because it would fit into the natural math of our body and brains. Huh. So I took seven pieces of music from a wide range of time periods and genres and composers. And I um, found the number of times each note appeared in the song. And then I graphed them, um, comparing them to a Ziff's law graph. And what I found was that music doesn't actually fit into Ziff's law. But no matter what the time period or genre or composer or song was, all of the song note distributions had the same shape on the graph. So even though music doesn't fit Ziff's law, there is some pattern that all people who write music are following involuntarily. That's amazing. And where does the forgetting information part of it come in? Um, I'm not really sure. Yeah. I just saw a big list of studies and I thought right. that all of them... You could have something there. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here and thank you for being back again, Brian. Great job. <laughs> Two thank years you. in a row. Awesome. And do we have one more student? I have one more student? Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Manchu. <laughs> He's prepared. Yep. So Manchu um, really can't take a lot of credit for him. He literally walked in my office and he said, how do I sign up for the state science fair? And I was like, well, first you need to go through <laughs> some paperwork some and steps. other steps before that. And he was like, so gung-ho. And he did went to state, he went to regionals, he went to the International Science Fair. And you want to tell us about your project? Sure. So I, not recently anymore, but I found out that once every 20 minutes, uh, somebody has to go to the emergency room uh, because they fell off their treadmill. Uh, and I also found that there are a lot of deaths regarding uh, treadmill falls. Uh, so when I read about this, I was kind of curious to see if there was a seamless way uh, that pre-existing treadmills can be set up so that uh, falls can be prevented and in the event that a runner falls, uh, friends or family can be notified uh, either at the push of a button or automatically. So I did several searches on websites like Amazon uh, and I actually ended up at the Patent and Trademark Database to see if somebody had kind of come up with an idea like this uh, and it turned out that they hadn't. So over the past year I've been designing this piece of hardware here um, and a piece of software that runs on iPhone, any Android device, the Apple Watch, and the Apple TV uh, that essentially splits the treadmill's belt into three virtual zones. Uh, the virtual green zone, yellow zone, and red zone, uh, which are three user configurable zones uh, in order to prevent a runner from falling and in the event that they fall, uh, notify friends and family automatically. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> get this idea from who is it that Google's executive's husband that has oh, yeah. Sandberg? Uh, Dave Goldberg was the CEO of SurveyMonkey and he actually fell off his treadmill uh, and he later died from head trauma and bleeding so wow. I actually read a lot of the statistics that kind of inspired this project from that article uh, and the more I thought about it the more I realized that this had, uh, device doesn't exist so I've built it and or filed for a patent on it. Wow. So, wow. Good for you. I was going to ask you. if you filed for a patent. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <Good on. laughs> well, could I have all five of you come up? And where um, was the International Science Fair? Uh, that's in Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix? So that was, I think, two weeks ago now. Wow. Cool. Just come on up here. I want, I want to give you all, uh, all of us, to give you a round of applause. And I would just like to congratulate <laughs> you Thank all. You. Um, you could start clapping at Okay. <laughs> Good yeah. thing. Nothing to follow that. We have uh, come upon our first opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone so from the public who would like to speak? Lord, just real quick. So let them know. Like we can. You guys are oh, welcome oh, to stay, yeah, yeah. but you I'm don't sure have to. It gets far less food. exciting from here. Yeah. So <laughs> if you have somewhere to be, please feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe they were waiting to get I'm to. I'm getting the option. I don't want to feel like. 
You don't know. Right. Crazy. Really, really interested in the. And it's by consensus. Okay. Was there anyone here from the public for public comment? <laughs> Okay, we will move on to reports to the school committee. And our first up is liaison reports. Mm -hmm. um, are there any updates from any of the liaisons? We have a really fresh one from yeah, the elementary school say, building committee because that meeting happened five it's minutes before this one. It's right probably still occurring. <laughs> yeah. um, we did meet as an elementary school building committee. Um, general updates are. Um, we made the most recent um, update submission to the MSBA. That's just a regular um, process where we submit project updates to the MSBA, including current budget, um, any decisions or design changes that have happened throughout the process. Um, the feedback we got from the MSBA was largely pro forma. Um, and I believe our next submission is in June for the 60%. It probably is. I have a calendar. Mm -hmm. um, I will ask for a, an electronic copy of this and share this with the committee as well. Um, yeah, I'm, it's not worth it. It's sometime in June. Um, and then the the probably the big detail piece that occurred while we were at the um, the meeting was um, we're starting to drill into um, building materials, especially for the exterior envelope. Um, we had made a decision as a committee at a previous meeting um, to go with um, CMU as the exterior material as opposed to brick, um, primarily because it runs about a $560,000 savings. Um, and it does look very nice on the school building. So today was they actually brought samples of different combinations. And we somewhat zeroed in on the, the facing of the school and some parameters for the, the color. We wanted to do that in advance of the project going before the planning board and the design review board. Um, and so again, just continuing to work out the details on the building. There are two educational user group meetings that are occurring in June to continue to um, frame the building around the educational plan, but um, all told, continued positive progress, so. Thank you. Um, any other liaison reports? Um, I have one for the CPAC group met last week and Dr. McLeod and Dr. Zaleski were both in attendance and, and gave a very thorough um, presentation on basically updating some new programs and uh, things that have been instituted this year since Dr. Seleski has joined the district. Um, I think all of the presentation was really met with positive feedback and I actually asked Dr. McLeod and Dr. Seleski if at some point in the near future and in, in an upcoming meeting we could have the same presentation for our uh, group in addition right. to you know talking about where we are with some of the data that will be collected and things of that nature. Um, and I, I mean, that was that was the big chunk of that meeting. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then, you know, there were, there's a couple of the, I think there's representation from the CPAC um, committee as well that will be on the um, Hopkinton's, um, the Hopkins principal search committee. And so they were, you know, discussing that upcoming thing as well, so. That was the big update, and I can't remember if we have a meeting in June or not. Um, Dr. Zaleski, do you have a meeting in June for CPEC? I don't believe so either. I think there there's talk of maybe one summer meeting if um, there's to be like a working group, but um, I believe that was our big last meeting of the year, which was very well attended. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the end of that report. Um, and so I... And now we're now moving into the liaison, mm -hmm. liaison roles, which I'll turn over to you. And I'll, I'll keep track. So um, I did have it on here, but I don't want to mess anything up with my present our presentation. So um, so I'll keep track to make all the changes. So obviously we have the chair, we have the vice chair, media spokesperson. Can um, I, sorry, can I make a suggestion? Please. Um, and some of them just go with chair uh, with certain right. roles, and and that I think we can take care of tonight. And I know that we need to vote the Arvine Todaro committee so that they can. Uh, that person could be sworn in and they can continue their forward momentum but I think that there are a couple that we might want to consider adding right I know there's one that I need to have a conversation with the Youth Commission and the coalition I'm not sure if they consider that to be a joint uh, which I, and I haven't had the opportunity to do that so I don't know do we need to decide all of them tonight or could we postpone some till the next meeting I, if just if that affects mm -hmm. people's yeah. Plan right about Tadaro really needs that. I know that. Yeah. I'm asking about the rest form. of them. If yeah. we need to vote the rest of them tonight, or if mm -hmm. we could just do the ones we need to, because I think they're. I think in the past we have done this in two. 
meetings where we had an initial discussion and tried to knock out some of them, but if there are open questions, we've come back to them. I, I don't have a particular problem with that. I think we That's just fine. focus on the ones that we I know. Need. I know, Jean, you wanted to add that, um, or, or to have some discussion around having somebody represent the turf field committee, of which I'm not sure what the status of that is. Um, and you mentioned 2020. And again, I don't know the status of that committee. Um, and the center school. So I think I feel that like we one. need to ask if they want a liaison. To, I mean, turf fields, that, that's our, but the other ones, they may or may not want a school committee liaison. So before we decide right. that we're liaison, right. liaising or whatever. Yeah. So those will be on hold because we don't really, there isn't really a center school committee to, yet yeah. in right. play. Okay. And it didn't occur to me until today, but um, mm -hmm. but there's the Hopcan Coalition, which I have filled that role. I don't know if they consider me a school committee liaison per se, and mm -hmm. so I really probably need to ask that question because it was sort of tied into the youth commission role, which okay. doesn't necessarily need to be, and I just don't have the answer to that. So um, I wanted to check if, if sure. that could be two. What is that? Well, and I don't know if, again, I don't know if, I actually don't know if I'm on that be as myself or as a school committee liaison, so I just need to clarify with them. But that's the coalition around um, drug that with the director of youth services and really mm -hmm. cross representation across police, fire, um, medical personnel, faith based personnel, mm -hmm. um, school uh, around uh, drug prevention. Hmm. And that we're calling that youth coalition? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's called uh, Hopcan Coalition. Yeah. So I know that we do need to um, to agree um, in terms of because we now this is our first meeting mm -hmm. of the new committee and we do need to determine who's going to be responsible for minutes. I think we should decide that tonight if that's okay. I would also push to have the CPAC liaison decided tonight only because okay. it was discussed at their meeting last week and mm -hmm. they they want to know. Um, what our decision is so right. and, and I, I received a letter today as well so it's more of the yeah. fact that they were expecting an outcome today and if we okay. if, we're, if we're comfortable doing that one tonight I would push for that one but that that's the only one that I have you know any kind of feeling on I'd suggest I mean I would suggest that we just go through the list mm -hmm. and if there, there's probably a lot we can yeah. reasonably knock out without a ton of discussion right I mean some yeah. of them you mentioned I mean typically I've just flown by them, those yeah ESBC but if, ESBC I, yeah. I don't Personally, say I don't see any particular value in changing at this point, unless I'd like to stay on. Yeah, I okay. would too. No, I know. I just also want to give Nancy the opportunity to ask questions about any yeah, of the roles and too. understand what they are, so that you know, that's when you have a new member that they get the opportunity to also understand the roles and express interest in things that they might have been interested in. So, okay. sure. Um, so just so you know, the reason why we're and John is probably pushing for keeping it the same with the SBC is because of the fact that the project's been ongoing for two and a half Absolutely. years at this point. Yeah. And so it, if we can keep a sense of consistency there, it would likely be helpful. Um, but right. I don't want it to thwart you from asking about no, it. But I would think so. there are a number of different liaison roles that would benefit from the continuity and that uh, they're all new to me, I'm equally. I, I'm not biased one way or the other against most of them, so I'm happy to pick up Thank you. You know, where, where it's needed. So, is so would that be minutes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I could do minutes, it's like a hazing um, but thing. I would. <laughs> it feels like hazing, <laughs> uh, but I would like to maybe um, have some coaching from the person. The only reason I, do, I was just trying to go back to the ones that we should decide tonight, so I apologize well, yeah, for if putting you on the spot. If we don't decide minutes tonight, I can just keep doing them through when we decide. Okay, so maybe we'll never decide it. We'll just easy, <laughs> easy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, what do you want to That's take funny. up tonight then, Lori? Well, so you were skipping over negotiations because we don't have any this Correct. year, which Gene and I are grateful for. Mm -hmm. Communications um, is the can, can I just say, for again, for Nancy's benefit, so we skipped over a media spokesperson too, and that's consistently, typically, the, the chair and vice chair. So just, I don't want, want to skip Thank over you. anything. So. Okay, and so the contract negotiations is unnecessary because we ratified our contract this year. Um, the community communications, I assume that's similar to the media spokesperson that's always traditionally been the chair. Yep. Yeah. The, okay. And then the minutes review, which <laughs> we were selling highly, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I, I will do the minutes. Um, uh, I don't know that Jean oh. didn't get to weigh in. I'm more than happy to. <laughs> no, you want it. I don't want to. We have to get caught up on, on the current minutes. We're, we're pretty close. We need to get caught up. In just for clarification, is the minutes review actually taking the minutes as well? No. No. Oh, all right. Well, the that's minutes are taken, easy. and then you're, they're sent to you, and okay. you review them. Okay. That I would be happier to do than taking them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Got it. 
Um, in the policy review. That's also in I, it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say the way we've been doing it this year, um, it, it, as part of our meetings, I don't know that there needs to be an individual or. Well, I actually, I would like to discuss going back to several iterations ago, um, and I think, in fairness, it it would be better to wait until the assistant superintendent is here. But I just found that um, I think that. You know, when we go through and make a list and identify up front what what um, policies we want to look at, that can those can be managed really by anybody. But I think, you know, in the past, um, in the you know, like Mary Colombo, when when she was responsible, was great about being really proactive. And I think the com the information about some policies that need to be changed because of changes to regulation or right, whatever right. wouldn't necessarily be on our radar screen sure. or um, but would be on this and I think it's uh, in fairness to you really too much for you to have on your plate so Thank if you. it's something that the, that the assistant superintendent would be amenable to yeah. I did like that um, okay that structure before and then sh that person usually worked with one school committee member to get them so we'll you know, hold sort that of in for shape now. to come but yeah okay Good idea. I don't remember what strategic planning was. So because we're in the middle of one now, it's mm -hmm. NA as well it's still. But is it but just the strategic plan? There were two school committee members who were highly involved in that, mm -hmm. Jean and Ellen, during during that time. So, okay. um, But we have a couple more years in this one. Mm -hmm. The budget working group. Uh, we haven't really, again, we haven't. Was the finance policies? Or well, was it was, it was partially the finance policies, but then it was also, I mean, the budget working group is something that we talk about every year and have been unsuccessful at executing with the town for pretty much every year that I've been involved. Um, so Actually, I, I think that's the budget advisory group. Well, the budget working group was ab so around our budget. Yeah, well, I think it's twofold. The budget, because the budget advisory was that aspirational, bigger thing right. where other ones, but the budget working group was also, we did, we would occasionally have some meetings, smaller meetings with just the chair of the board of select, or somebody from the board of selectmen and the town manager. Um, I, I don't think that those ever have come to fruition either. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, from a budget working group perspective, most of the, I'm not most of, of in my name's checked there, and from this year's budget, I don't think I did anything, Dr. McLeod, that I recall outside of, I mean, our budget working group was this group of five, so. Yeah, I, I would advocate putting a hold on this one just because I think, um, you know, we need to take a look, a sort of a longer term look at our budget. We have some things looming, and I think it would be helpful to have a multi year understanding of what's coming our way particularly um, in regard to the new building and whatnot and so if that is better facilitated by you know one person sort of working collaboratively and then bringing it back you know that's that's fine but that's another thing that we've talked about for a while and not really had the bandwidth to do but I think um, you know the opportunity that pre presents itself to still do that with Mr. Dumas well, is too good to pass up. Uh, uh, you, you know. You set them up for success, yeah. Ralph. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So can I just ask you a question because <laughs> it's not been something I've been a part of in the two years I've been on the board. What was the, I mean, I know we're putting it on hold and we can have further discussion at a point, but it would be helpful in making a decision at another meeting to understand what was the purpose behind the budget working group? Because I kind of, when John said like collectively us as a group, that was you know, we collectively so, work on the budget. Yeah. So previously, I mean, I think I've, my name's been checked there for a few years now, and, and we have had it in, on occasion where we have, um, you know, I think this year's budget was probably a little bit unique in terms of past budgets, in terms of uh, that there were certainly significant strategic initiatives, but there wasn't as much sort of do we need to make critical decisions from the initial budget. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was more of a role where if there was feedback from the committee at a meeting, it was an in smaller subcommittee of two or one that could go back with Dr. McLeod and Mr. Dumas and try to hash through some options for maybe how we could achieve what the mm -hmm. committee was voicing mm -hmm. and then bring it back to the committee. It I think that was the idea of it, but yeah. And it was also the year with that we took up all that policy. Mm -hmm. And so and the, the working group right. did yep. a lot of mm -hmm. pre-meeting pre around that to mm -hmm. bring back to. Okay. Yeah, yeah both okay. actually making them and then the existence of those right. finance policies also probably Re reduce the need for that working group in and of itself. Yeah. So that's true. Yeah. So I, th yeah, I, I would agree. I think putting a hold on this pending what we okay. see. I, but I also fully support the idea of creating some sort of multi-year look. Great. 
And the budget advisory group was a broader group to deal with other town. The budget advisory was made up of the uh, the town manager, the chair of the board of selectmen, the chair of the school committee, Mr. Dumas, and the superintendent, or the director of finance and the superintendent. Um, and I think it's something that we should definitely explore again, um, just to see if we can resurrect that. And who was the originator of it? Was it the school committee or was it the board of selectmen? I think it was a it joint was, it between was the, the... Yeah, it was the standard practice yeah. until seven years ago. Um, and it has been sort of moved away from, but... Uh, okay. We can hope. Okay, so it looked like in last year it was the chair mm -hmm. and another school committee member. Mm -hmm. Is there a need for two school committee members or is it really just the chair? Um, should we I'd be leave that up to be the second discussion? Person. Well, okay. I mean, we can decide later. Maybe it makes more sense once we figure out to put that on hold with the budget working group okay. as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And have a. All right. The charter. I, I do think it would be helpful if I can stay on that. Okay. I'm not sure you're going to get much argument on that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anybody <laughs> jumping. It leans away. Um, so the ADA committee, which is a voting member, Kelly, uh, did they meet no, this year? No, they yeah. did not. I can keep that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kelly. Unless somebody else wants to fight for it. That's fine. I had it for two years and I only met on one of them, so. Okay. <laughs> So maybe you're, maybe you're due. I think, that's yeah. a, <laughs> I think that's how you convinced her last year. Right. <laughs> um, so the Appropriations Committee, was that traditionally the chair? Yep. Okay. And the Board of Selectmen the same? Capital Improvements Committee as well? Uh, but, it, I mean, does it have to be that way? It's always been the chair. I think, you know. Well, I mean, I guess the, all those committees you're meeting with in budget season and getting ready for the presentations and things it probably makes sense to okay. keep it that way so I'm not opposed to it I just was double checking that there wasn't okay. mm -hmm. um, and then the sustainable green committee I don't think there is one any longer I just have Peggy yeah that's all my little Peggy liaison yeah but not really much from sustainable green I get emails about how the um, textile box does that's about what extent. I meant was I'm not sure that there's a committee Oh, I thought I was just hearing from some of oh. them, but I've never gotten an advice before. There? Okay. I think they still exist. She con um, Peggy Barton contacted me a while ago, and it was about um, Green Up Day, mm -hmm. and ba and had said indicated to me that there really right. she, she didn't feel like there was a committee. Oh, okay. Yeah, done by one person mm -hmm. on the side, but I can check with her to see if there's actually a committee. Okay, so we want to put that on hold until we know if there's yeah, like check actually a committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. The legislators. That's typically chair. That's okay. like Representative Dykema and Senator Spilka, love legislature. Okay. I think there is actually still a green committee, but I think the chair moved out of town and it kind of fell apart at that point. So, but I'll, I'll check on that one. I used to get invites to that one. Hmm? Jay Shree? No, it was. Andy Boyce. Andy Boyce, yeah. Oh, okay. I used to get invites okay. from them and then it kind of just completely stopped. Actually, my neighbor's on that. Mm -hmm. I'll go check with my neighbor. All right, the Marathon Fund Committee. So this was me. Um, there was one meeting that they invited Ellen to because they didn't know. I think it had changed, and I got <laughs> the invite the day before, and I was away. Okay. So I'm happy I to got keep the it. Invite too. I think <laughs> okay. she sent it to me too. I'm happy to keep it, and I will communicate with them the change and make sure that. Okay. Yeah, I'm involved if, unless anybody really wants it. Okay. Um. All right, so Lori, we're down to CPAC. I did, if, if that's okay, I did receive a letter um, sure, he, from CPAC um, requesting that um, the school committee consider um, having Lori continue as their liaison. And they had many nice things to say about just um, what a good listener you are and um, that they feel that it's been very, a very positive relationship. So, And so what I, I, I it did come up during their meeting last week. Um, it was... It was a humbling agenda item. But uh, what I did say to them, and I want to say to the group, because it, it, I, I am interested in c keeping the role because I've actually really enjoyed working with the group, and I feel like I've learned a lot, especially as a, per as a person that doesn't have a special needs child, and I just don't know a lot about that area in the district, and I feel like it's just given me a different set of eyes. 
Um, that being said, and I did say this to the group, was that you know far be it for me to keep another school committee member from having the opportunity to get to know that group. So I, I don't want to be putting the blocks on it from that perspective. But if there isn't strong interest from somebody else in the group, then I would be happy to maintain that relationship. So. Um, I, I just wanted to state that because I didn't want anyone to feel pressured not to say, yeah, you know, I really want to get involved there. So, um, so if we want to hold, you know, I, like I said, I'd like to vote on that tonight just because I, they were of the expectation we were deciding all of our liaison mm -hmm. rules tonight. But if people are uncomfortable with voting it tonight, then we can hold that one too. So, I don't see any need to hold it. I'm no, I mean, happy I think for you to do it. If you already have a lot on your list, mm -hmm. so if you're willing to keep it, that's entirely up to you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, they're they are a great group yeah. um, to work with. I, it, you know. Yeah, I mean, the once a month meetings are have not been, uh, you know, largely in conflict with anything else in my life. So it's really not been that. Well, difficult. and if it becomes too much, I, I can always bring it up. And she in the middle of the year, Jean, Jean, you were liaison for a few years. I was. Years. I mean, and it, it is. It's very important. I mean, it's obviously a really important voice. Um, and uh, but I think it's I, that's a great testament to the relationship that they're developing with you. Yeah. So if you're able to continue it, I think that's wonderful. Great. Thank you. And so we're on the tech voting member was always well. It has been that's traditionally Dr. McLeod. It doesn't have to be though. And I know I will continue to be uh, I don't have to be on the board I will continue to attend the meetings if somebody would like to be the voting member I'm that's fine with me so we have two two spots for that right there's the voting member and sorry every time I do that it's making yeah, mm -hmm. it's noise um, the voting member and then the non voting member which so last year the voting member was Dr. McLeod and the non voting yeah. member was Jean mm -hmm. um, and I know Jean said that they meet once a month, is that what it is? Um, every other month every on other Friday month. morning. And uh, I mean, I would say it's entirely up to, to you and your schedule. I, uh, we both go most of the time. We don't yeah. always each yeah. make all the meetings. But, um, but having said that, whether or not um, you're the voting member, it's a great learning opportunity for a school committee member. Yeah, I guess um, the only thing that I think about, I mean, so obviously this was one of my goals for mm -hmm. this year. For this year. Um, but I did. I am on the um, the director's evaluation committee. Yep. And so I'm thinking, if I don't have a vote, then I wouldn't be able to weigh in on her evaluation. Right. And so maybe for that reason alone, yeah. I should should sure. continue to be the voting and member. And I think we have to take our vote and and, and inform them. We do shortly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. We do. Yeah. I, that was one I was going to hope that we could do tonight. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to keep Dr. McLeod as the voting member, and for the non-voting member, does, is there anyone else? And I, I'm, I'm not asking Nancy to do it. I'm just saying that we haven't given her anything else other than the minute review. So I was just wondering if she had thoughts on that. Or Jean, I know you enjoy going to the meeting, so obviously wouldn't want to take it away from you if you would desire to keep it. Um, or if anyone else has interest. It's also not limited. No. Right, we can any all go, any right? school yeah. committee yeah. member yeah. is, is I mean, more important. than welcome to go, so you could both attend, or yeah. you could alternate, or. Yeah, in fact, the first year that I did it, Rebecca and I both did it. Um, what's of particular, I mean, it's, well, anyways. So anyone is welcome to join me. We don't have to vote on that. It doesn't have to be the same person every time. So, um, you know, if you want to come and check it out and decide, <laughs> you can do that too. I would be happy to come along. I think you'll enjoy it. Every so other Friday morning. I see morning. the note. Yeah. yeah. Every, every other month. On a, on a, on a Friday, Friday morning. morning. Okay. I, That's yeah. what I was just going to ask. Did, were we supposed to be putting that on the calendar so that the rest of us would know about when that was going to be? Or I have those dates now, so mm -hmm. I would yeah, be happy to get them. Because I'd like to, to, to just add them I'd in like there. We'll do. The one I thing can. I will yeah, say, yeah, whether like you're able to make their regular meetings or not, um, the legislative breakfast, which I think we all get invited to every year, is a really great opportunity. That's a fantastic thing that they host. Um, and so I really, whether you can make any of the other meetings or not, that is particularly a good one. What time of year is it? It's I? usually in um, Marchish. Okay. Yeah. Right. It, April. This March. time it was scheduled right up against February vacation. So. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. But they're aware of that going forward. But yes, February, March. Okay. So. I don't know where we landed on that one. Are we just We're leaving on. it as? Yep. Okay. And then the youth commission. So that's been me, and they meet on a night that I have a regular conflict. So I'm not going to be able to con continue 
on the Youth Commission, but that's one I would like to put a hold on because I'd like to speak to them okay. as well as the coalition and see if okay. there's an expectation that it's the same person or not. Okay. Okay. The planning board. So this was me. Um, I mean, honestly, it was less of a liaison role and more the person to follow up when something came up that we either weren't informed about or had a question about. Um, I think it's probably important, given the given the amount of projects that are going on in town um, and their potential impact on enrollments. But um, I, I don't have any. I'm I'm fine not keeping it if somebody's interested in the role. Was there? I'm trying to figure out. Was there any reason that you were on it because of the SBC stuff? And keeping so track I think. Of that? So if there was, I don't think. It's in hindsight, that one. was good reasoning, um, just because <laughs> the ESBC has its own sort of uh, connection with the planning board. And um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't. In my role in the ESBC, I never really interacted with the planning board. I could pick that up if you. I mean, if you want it, I'm happy to let you keep it. But I'm happy to take that. No, up. that's fine. That's fine with me. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Nancy. And then the Irvine Tadara Committee voting member. Obviously, that was an urgent matter to take up because of yes. Alan's departure. Um, I don't exactly, I mean, I know that this is related to the uses for the Irvine Star property. Yeah, I went to a meeting two weeks ago when Ellen was gone and we didn't have somebody to go. So it is, it's, it's, it's in its infancy. Mm -hmm. They're really working on putting together a community survey now to solicit ideas from the community on uses for the property. Um, I thought it was a really interesting role, but I think similar to ESBC, it would be something that if somebody took it on, it would be nice if it was more than just one year because of the continuity of that committee. I think it's going to be a multi-year committee. Um, so I think it's a, a very interesting idea because they're they're looking at from anything, for any use right. from the community right now so they're really opening it up and trying to solicit ideas so they're really you're able to get them kind of on the ground floor of this one if, if anyone wants this one but because i'm only around for one more year i'm guessing that i shouldn't keep it because i think it would benefit from the cool. longer tenure of somebody being on it just my opinion I, I would be interested in that and i am here for at least three years anyway. yeah okay okay I wasn't Lenders. looking straight at you when I said <laughs> <laughs> But I think I, it's I uh, something that's really we good to grow with from their yeah. very beginning. Do we need to vote on these? Jane, do we have to vote Should on the tech voting member? I thought yes. you said something about needing to vote we on We have it. to vote on that, and we have to, it sounds like we have to vote on the Irvine Tadaro so that they can be sworn in. Sure. <laughs> Who, I, anything, any, anybody that needs to be sworn in, we should vote on. Okay. I would. Is my opinion. Yeah, I would agree. And take them all up. Do you want to take them up separately then? Beginning with ESBC. For, um, well, ESBC, we don't. I don't. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know. we don't have to. Project, that's only. Think. Yeah, yeah, right. I'm <laughs> I already <laughs> sworn in. I couldn't get away from that. Kelly's already ADA. Yeah, I Sorry. think I'm even sworn in on ESBC. So yeah, I think are. it's just in tech. I'm already there. I think it's. It's just Irvine to But tech, I think, we don't you need to take an annual we vote on tech? We do. I think we have to vote and report. We have It can't hurt. Okay, so <laughs> would anyone be inclined to make a motion to appoint Dr. McLeod as our tech voting member for the Hopkinton School District? So moved. Second. Uh, motion by Ms. Birchman, second by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. Thank you. And for the Irvine Todaro Committee, um, seeking a motion to appoint Ms. Kavanaugh as the voting member and liaison, I guess, for the school committee. So moved. Second. Mo uh, motion by Ms. Birchman, second by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so carries. I'll put together a letter yeah. to El Elaine Lazarus, yeah. and do you know That's when the next meeting is? I do not know when the next okay. meeting is. All right. Yeah. Okay, so the next uh, item on the agenda was the summer meeting date. So the reason I had asked that we put that on tonight's agenda is that the next agenda on the 16th is jam-packed, and then it's the 30th. So out of the interest of people's summer plans, I thought that we there could be the danger of us not being able to find anything in common unless yeah. we take it up now. I'm not available on the 30th. I am also not available on the 30th. Okay. Oh, neither am I. 
Well, there you go. We definitely should never meet on the 30th. So we won't meet the 23rd, but. So we're just not going to meet on the 30th? And so we should try to meet the first week of July. But is that a problem from end of year no. balance? No. So what so are our meetings scheduled right now in June? Uh, 16th and 30th. Okay. So shall we try to meet on July the 7th? So I we're only going to have one meeting in June? Can I ask you a question? When you say no, it's not an issue for end of year balances because you we can wrap it all up by the 16th? Yes. Okay. Just check. <laughs> no. We what can wrap it no all up by July 15th. Oh, we can, so yeah. that's, but see, that's the important question. So you're, we do still need to have a meeting before July 15th. Yeah. Okay, that's sure. what I wanted so to know. So we do July 7th. So does the 7th work? Yeah. I thought we were meeting on, Ju on June 9th, no? No, that got moved ahead um, because of a personal commitment that I have. I'm sorry. Okay, so we're meeting the 16th this and 16th. the 30th. Okay. All right. Originally it was 16th and 30th, but now, now we're not, now we're not meeting the 30th. 30th. And I cannot do the 7th. Instead? I'm out of town that week. Of July. Sure well, back. we need to meet before the fifteenth, mm -hmm. so we have to. We could also look at other days. Oh, you're out for well, the week. What about the what about 14th? July seventh, fourteenth? Well, I just I need to see if I I'm, uh, I just need to pull up. I'm I'm not 100 percent positive if I'm in town either. I don't Summer remember Institute. when I get back. I could do the fourteenth, but I can't do the seventh. I know I can do the fourteenth. Well, well how many either. do we have for the seventh? Well, that's I'm, that's what I'm finding out. Oh. It's racing Hold, for please. John's phone. Hold, please. You're on the I'm available the seventh. Gene, are you available the seventh? I'm available the seventh and the fourteenth. Nancy, I'm available well. both. I'm not available the seventh. I'm not available the fourteenth. <laughs> Kathy Trump's John and Kelly. Okay. So we either have three committee members on the thirtieth or three committee members on the seventh. <laughs> no, we don't have three on the thirtieth. No, I had two. Not on the thirtieth, the seventh or the fourteenth. You're talking about. I could do the thirtieth. You could do the thirtieth. Yeah, and the right. Could do the I can't do the thirtieth. Oh, three of us can do the thirtieth. All right. Yes. Yeah, so so can we do it on Thursday? Um, I do have a suggestion. Oh, and on Thursday, that might be a better idea. What about the twenty-third? I can't. What about we do back to back the sixteenth? No, nope. I'm on a business trip the twenty-third. Okay. And it's my birthday, which I would. I've think done that before. We could have <laughs> done, yeah, yeah, done, done that, but I'll be in Chance Chicago instead. Eighteenth, right? Are there four of us for the twenty-third? I could do the twenty-third. Yep. No, there's no. three of us. Okay. <laughs> three seems to be so done. here's what I will do in the interest of time and all these doodle. wonderful people the waiting. I'll do a doodle okay. calendar, invite. I'll give suggestions for July and August, understanding that we need to meet before the 15th. And we'll go with the majority. Sure. Do we have a lot for June already that we need two June meetings and a July meeting? Or is it light? We'll be we okay. One and one? We did have the secondary um, uh, school improvement plan report for the 30th but I can work with Evan to find out if he can come at some point okay. in July are we doing an, a strategic plan update on the 16th, on the 16th? okay yeah. thank you okay you and I will talk and then I'll do a doodle okay Ralph and I will put something together and doodle you oh, why was the reason that we didn't do June 2nd because of is any senior activity no, that's no, no it first. isn't no it's June 1st then it would be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. With well, because at this point we have like something the everyone's lined up for the 16th. So oh. but we're lined up for the second. Aren't we doing oh, a yeah. meet and greet thing yeah. on the second? Right. That's right. Oh, oh. Could to that point, that, to that point, that's on the right. calendar. Yeah, yeah, like we're going with this. Yeah. Well, well, that's why we were free on the second. Bit? We're posted. Okay. Okay. I will have to see if people can, you know, be yeah. prepared for something that they thought they had until the 16th sure. to be ready for. But I'll see what I can do. So we'll see if we can do the second and the 16th following your meeting with the candidates. And you still need to do doodle for the summer. And I'll doodle it anyway. Yeah. yeah. All right. OK. All right. So the second is the Hopkins Principal no, Forum. No, 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 no. Right. right. Not the interview, because that's the third. That's the third first? Or the I thought it was the other way around. The other way around. The, 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 way around. the, the forum. interview is the second. Yeah. And this, the second is at six. Yes, I will talk to you. Okay. All right. So the superintendent's report. Mr. Dr. Dumas just told me that he's going to be in Italy on the June June second. Oh. You can't see. move that. No, but we will figure something out. So I will take care of this Can in, in the interest of moving things along. <laughs> so um, if I there. could um, invite uh, Mr. Youngberg, thank you for waiting, Ms. Ms. Ekbal, and Dr. Zaleski to join me um, for the presentation for the district performance update. No, we changed the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so Meredith is our elementary curriculum it's director it's and Dr. Zaleski is our director of student services and Dave is our director of secondary curriculum 
and we have been working throughout the year jointly along with the admin council and all of the administration um, on focusing on the strategic plan and the priority initiatives. Um, and tonight we want to update you on where we are there. This will set us up for my next report, which is on recommendations on strategic priorities and, and strategic plan moving forward. So we felt that this was an important place to provide you with the information um, so that when we have that next conversation, perhaps on June the 2nd, um, you have some, some background to be thinking about. Um, so I'll see if I can make this work. But um, did it go? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, HCAM, for setting this up for us. Um, under effective instruction, um, the, the strategic objective that we've been really focusing on this past year is communicate high expectations for all students. Um, and what this really means is that we've been using student assessment results to establish high expectations, to be able to have conversations with teachers, with students, with parents on how students are doing and communicating that our expectation is that all students will achieve to their potential, identifying what that is, and then using those results to um, create or develop instructional plans that will, will move us towards meeting those high expectations. We've talked a lot about you know, if the, expect, the expectation that we're communicating is that they're doing it the best that they can do, um, they're going to continue to do the best that they can do. But if we have high, are communicating high expectations to students and then providing them with the tools that they need and the motivation that they need to be successful, um, our, our students that were here tonight, we don't need to worry about motivating them, right? There. But uh, they, we do have a lot of students that, that need that extra push or that motivator or that recognition that will really motivate them to, to really want to achieve at, at, their, at their very highest potential. Um, so that's what uh, that piece is around. The second is implementing evidence-based high quality instructional practice. And Dr. Zaleski, Dr. Zaleski and I will come back um, because all of what we're talking about tonight transcends general education special education, we're working jointly on all of these things and this is pieces of this you've already presented to CPAC but I think it's important that we come back and call out specifically all of the things that you've achieved in your very short tenure mm -hmm. here already. Okay. Um, so implementing the evidence-based high quality instructional practices is something that Dr. Zaleski has been working on throughout the year. Um, basically let's figure out what those practices are and and who's receiving what instruction, and it's the same thing in general education. Um, under student assessment, implement a variety of assessments that examine both short and long-term growth of students. At the, um, the way forward, I know Jean and Nancy, you were there. I talked about using assessments in a very informed way, not over-testing kids if we're duplicating our efforts and if the assessments that we're using is not providing us with information that we can use to guide instructional decisions, then we're starting to ask as a team, why are we doing it? Which of, those, which of these assessments is useful? Which are repetitive? Um, on the positive side, there are many, many assessments that are available to us in this district. And we're at a place where we have so much data that we can actually sort through the data and figure out which ones um, are triangulated and providing consistency, and which ones are not. So the rest of it is there. Um, sharing assessment results is something that we've taken on this year and will continue next year so that parents are informed and can interpret the results. Um, for example, the BAS is something that I know it's one thing to provide the results, but I know the elementary principals have reached out to parents to help them understand what does this exactly mean for my child and what are the expectations, what are the benchmarks, and where does my child um, sit compared with the, the benchmarks. Um, and then, very importantly, making sure that they're readily, readily accessible to educators. Um, because if we want them to be using assessment results to plan instruction, we need to make sure that we make it readily, readily available. Um, finally, under student assessments, you've heard us talking about adjustment to practice all year long. You will hear us continue to talk about it next year. Really demonstrating student growth or lack thereof, and then using that data to plan instruction. Um, and to that end, when we talk about adjustment to practice, what does it really mean? And this slide points out the, the basically the four steps. The first is to provide a focus 
um, around the data that we're using to bring teams together so that we can start talking about which strategies would be useful. Um, looking, the second round of assessment is to reassess how are we doing so towards that goal. Our, this is where we're using formative assessments, we're using benchmark assessments to say we set a goal, um, we had a focus, we implemented strategies, now how are we doing? And you've heard us talk a lot about the fact that we're not going to wait for MCAS to know how we're doing. We're going to be using a variety of assessments to be able to look at the blue, the blue box, which is really the important one, around how are we going to respond to the information that we found out at the end of October, middle of November, that the student either is not progressing at the speed at which we would like them to be able to, or has already exceeded the benchmark for that particular um, grade level. And so how will we respond to that information? And that, in a nutshell, is what we mean by adjustment to practice. Here's another slide that looks at it a little bit more deeply. We identify the problem using data and our understanding of student profiles and learning needs, we determine the cause. So that is a very, that takes a team and we've been really working across again, um, the team approach, bringing in specialists, reading specialists, learning specialists to help, to help us identify the data and determine the cause um, at, to the best of our knowledge as to why a student may or may not be making progress and then responding appropriately. Sometimes it can be regrouping students based on a common need. Sometimes it can be providing a targeted intervention or recommending an intervention to be used with greater fidelity based on our data. Um, and sometimes it can be um, that the child has achieved the goal that we set for them and we need to re set a new goal. And we can, again, not have to wait until the end of the year to do that. We're doing it on an ongoing basis. So I'm going to turn the next slide, um, Dave and Meredith, I think you're going to jump in here. Sure. And if I could just add on to what Please. Um, you were talking about, Dr. McLeod, uh, in addition to the academic data that we have, we also have the early warning indicator system data, which is um, a database provided by the State uh, Department of Education, uh, which enables all of the administrators in each of the buildings, and those administrators are determined, they might be principals, it might be guidance counselors, um, in some cases they're lead teachers or classroom teachers. They look at uh, sets of data in which um, it uh, explains to them uh, attendance, levels of attendance that the student has had, if they have had any frequent moves, if they've moved between districts, mm -hmm. if they might be um, an English language learner. Um, so that is the other sort of background data that is combined with some of the academic data. Um, so it, it really enables us to look at the whole child approach um, given um, some circumstances where we involve guidance and um, school uh, psychologists as well. So it really gives us some informed information in a, in a well-rounded way. And it's not just the teacher working by themselves, um, as Dr. McLeod alluded to, that they're working in a team of educators. Um, in, our, in terms of the data analysis meetings, um, would you like to speak to that? Ms. Sure, Paul? absolutely I will. So uh, over the past couple of years, we've uh, begun to meet, uh, principals and curriculum directors have begun to meet with educators around the data that we've been collecting. Who are the students in your class who um, are going to require additional supports? How do you know? What information can you bring to the table? Or who do we need to pull in, as Dr. McLeod alluded to earlier, that can help us determine how best to support the students' learning and growth? Um, and so we, as a part of that process, we have the educator bring to the table all of the data that they have accessible to them. Sometimes the administrator has additional data from previous school years that, that we have to pull together in order to get a bigger picture on the student. And we really focus in on those students who are most at risk for not making appropriate progr progress toward our benchmarks and our expectations, in other words, meeting the standards um, by the end of the year. Uh, we ask the educator, so what's working? What are you doing that's working? And most often, the educator has already started to implement some kind of an, uh, an intervention. They've already made their best guess based on how the student is performing in the classroom. So they start to indicate what has been working. 
And then we start to look at, so what's not working? What have you tried that's not working? And we try to tease out some of those patterns for instruction that will be most effective for the student and most efficient for the student. Because the goal is to close those achievement gaps as opposed to just continue to make moderate progress, but never actually close that gap. As a result of those conversations, the educator as part of a team is uh, making decisions about what are we going to do differently that will support and help close up those gaps for the student. Um, and so as part of this nice conversation that we have with the, the teachers, we're hearing them say, I hadn't thought of that, or where can I find that resource, or where else can I look? Um, and as part of that team approach, it's been really successful for supporting educators, meeting our goal of helping students to narrow those gaps that they're struggling with, and as an administrative team, having conversations between ourselves about what is it that we need to do better in terms of helping our educators be effective. And in some cases, we may look at the data and see overall trends, and that may lead to uh, questions such as, is this accurate? Is this information telling us what we're seeking? So um, that uh, leads us into making sure that we are taking at least three different pieces of data or data sets. Um, so that we can get an accurate picture of how that student is achieving. And in, in addition to that, especially um, at the upper elementary and secondary level, you'd mentioned the goal setting piece. This, the education team um, gets together and they will set goals, whether it be a four or a six or an eight week goal, they'll write it out. Um, it needs to be a strategic goal. It needs to be something that's measurable, um, something that's realistic and attainable. We call those uh, SMART goals. and um, at, in many cases, we get the students to uh, be involved with that goal setting process so that they understand um, what we are trying to um, help them to achieve. And uh, that is that comes into the part of the motivation piece and also making sure that students understand that they also have a responsibility um, to help us help them, <coughs> to help us help them. Um, this chart shows you the class at the class level data analysis. This is actually an example taken from uh, second grade. And on the left-hand side, each of those uh, letters indicates a different class. So class A all the way through class J. Um, what we're looking at here is, in a particular math assessment, looking um, at a uh, benchmark assessment, the percentage of average percentage of correct answers um, based on each class in the fall compared to the mid-year benchmark, which is in the winter. And as you can see for class A, for example, in the fall, that particular class average was 56.7%. When they were um, reassessed in the winter, uh, that, one, that class average went up to 76.7% with a growth percentage of 20 points. And so we're not only looking at achievement, but we're looking at growth over time. Um, and growth is really what we try to um, implement within our um, whole child approach where we're trying to get students to see where they started and where they ended up so that they're not necessarily being compared um, to their immediate peer, but they're um, looking at their own achievement over time. Um, we look at these patterns and you need to look very carefully at these because on a first glance you might think, well, classroom B, why are there growth percentage points at 36.7? And you might look at classroom G, you look at their growth points at 10. Well, in that particular case, you can see um, classroom G started at a very high uh, percentage at 60% relative to the other classes. So over time, you typically see um, not as much growth in, um, in cases where they already start at a very high point. So then we need to look at, well, how can we challenge those students in those classrooms to make sure that we're going beyond um, their, their learning um, points, their learning achievement, um, to be able to make sure that we're pushing them to the next level. So as part of our communication, sorry, did you want to no. ask a question? <laughs> and so as part of our communication um, goal that Dr. McLeod was alluding to earlier, we um, principals have communicated with families, had sessions um, at principals' coffees. How do you read the data? Because if I was a parent and I was looking at um, some of those um, data points at the beginning of the year, I would be shocked if, to think that my child scored only a 23% on 
one of the fall benchmarks. But the idea is that we're assessing students on the same exact standards three times during the year, and that's where we get that more accurate picture of growth, as opposed to changing the standards or changing the level of expectation throughout the year. That's much harder to figure out the growth when the target keeps changing. Um, and so we had opportunities to speak with parents about what does that mean, what does that look like? In terms of gathering this information, this data, and having the data analysis meetings with educators, um, which we just refer to as data meetings for the most part, um, we are able to sit down and look at um, individual students that we feel might be at risk for not either maintaining or closing um, their gaps in terms of greater growth. Uh, and we're able to use, as Dr. McLeod said, uh, various pieces of data that we have. Now some of those are short-term assessments, like a unit test. We just gave, taught a unit, we assessed you at the beginning, we assessed you at the end, how much growth did you make? And what kind of growth would we expect from the beginning of the unit to the end of the unit? Some of them are more long-term, like the benchmark data that we just looked at, beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year. Some of them are um, more performance tasks, like when we do the benchmark assessment, system reading uh, assessment, we're asking students to actually do the reading, not bubble off multiple choice answers. That's a very different type of task. And that also often has a much higher expectation for on the high end than being able to guess which bubble is the most uh, a accurate bubble for the response, if you will. Um, so we take all kinds of assessment information and we, uh, with the teacher, we look at um, what kinds of supports we've already been giving the student and whether we need to discontinue the services, in other words, the, the extra services, supports, whether we need to continue them because the student is not making enough gains in, an, um, in a short period of time, or whether we need have students that have popped up on our radar since our previous data meeting. Um, and so in the examples that you see on the screen, uh, the first student where it says discontinue on the right hand side may have some lower scores like 65 and 69, but look at the gains this student has made. The gain is a 118 point gain. This is a student who very likely can be discontinued from being pulled out of the gen ed classroom for additional supports and interventions and the teacher then takes over and provides the differentiated supports or scaffolds in the classroom during the instruction to help that student maintain. In the second example where it says continue, you can see where it says G, the growth is 20. That is a much smaller growth over the same period of time. And this is a student that even though the student is getting somewhere around the 77, 80 um, percent on the topic tests, those short-term tests, the students retaining for it from the beginning of the topic to the end of the topic, but maybe isn't being able to synthesize the information or apply it over a longer period of time like a benchmark. This is a student we would continue with support services um, in order to support a little bit longer. In the last example, this is a student whose average is a 78, but this student's growth is only at a six. And the student scored, say, a 790 when a 945 is expected for proficiency. This is a student that if, the, if continues on this path, the gap is going to start widening. And so this is a red flag for us and we say, wow, what does this student need? How are we going to help this student get back on track so that they're keeping that gap closed as opposed to allowing it to gradually widen? And that's where these data teams become so important. On the next slide, we have um, a student example of a student success plan. Now, each of the buildings has a slightly different format but the content is generally the same. So we've identified the students as part of the data meeting. We've looked at their data. We've now I've identified where they have individual needs. It might be English language arts. It might be mathematics. It might be very specific to reading comprehension, or it might be more broad based around um, other challenges that the student is facing. And sometimes it's more around um, the student needs additional supports for attention or memory, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific academic area. Then we take a look at what we're currently doing. Remember that, what are we doing and is it working or is it not working? So we've identified what it is we're doing, what resources we're using. In the next section, we're looking at how we're doing the adjustment to practice that we were talking about earlier. We're looking at what the student needs to have adjusted for him or for her in order to be successful. And the first example is that the student reads all of his or her assessments aloud to the teacher for the three subject areas listed, and that's so that the, there's uh, communication with the student 
and with the teacher on a regular basis around what is it that you're expected to do? Do you understand? How can I help you? How are you going to get started? In the next column, we're looking at this, um, the data. How are we going to know from this point forward if the student's making enough gains? And so we identify as part of the goal setting, we identify what data we're going to look at. Well, in this case, we're going to look at the student's test and quiz scores, and we're expecting them to improve. And usually, we have something very specific about what kind of growth we want to see. Because remember, the student who had the growth of 20 versus the student who had the growth of 18. And in the last column, we have some kind of a follow-up. We try to keep it to six to eight weeks. We meet again with the teacher, look at the same student, new data. What is it telling us? We go through that cycle all over again. Um, in some cases, this results in a discontinue. We're doing a great job. The student's doing a great job. Let's continue with supports in the classroom, but no longer pull the student out, but continue to monitor the student's growth and progress. Because we don't just let the student go back into the classroom and say, have fun. We want to make sure that they're still maintaining that kind of growth. Um, with the supports being provided in the classroom as we start to kind of pull away a little bit. Um, and again, we'll follow up in another six to eight weeks and ask, how is the student doing now? And I'd like to point out the specificity of the, the difference that you see under the adjustment column versus the current practice column, which was uh, also could have been labeled, labeled past practice. Mm. And the other strength of the student success plan that we've been communicating is acknowledging the very many transitions that our students go through we feel that having something documented like this that can be passed on to next year's teacher to say not only what worked but what didn't work um, in this particular case we're showing you an example of things that really did work for this child but you could just as easily be seeing examples of under adjustment let's try this and then you know what eight weeks later we're not seeing the progress that we would want to see so going forward we would hope that okay that doesn't work for this student and and the other thing that I really appreciate um, about this work is how individualized it is. So where you see accommodated tests and quizzes, um, I, I don't, that, that's really not very specific. But when you see student reads all of her assessments aloud to the teacher, okay, now I understand what it was that the accommodation was that you did, and I can see that it worked, so I can continue that, you know, when, when that child moves into my classroom. So. Um, it's very powerful work taking place. Thank you, Meredith. You're welcome. And, and Dave. Did you want to add, were you about to jump um, in I, when I, I did? I was just going to say it's also based on student strengths. So um, yes. none of these plan, not one plan would look alike. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, if you have a student who has a very strong verbal capacity, for example, they might, um, one of their accommodations, they may take a test or a quiz orally rather than um, written out or ha having someone um, scribe for them. So uh, these are the types of accommodations that we try to build upon student strengths while also building those skills um, as those students progress um, through the grade levels. So with all of that great work, we are articulating high expectations. Um, oftentimes when we speak of learning gap, you know, there could be an implication that the onus is on the student for not learning the material. However, here in Hopkinton, we've taken it to the next level. We've taken it to the level of opportunity to learn and providing students with necessary opportunities through instruction as well as specialized instruction to learn material and then we're adjusting accordingly. And that really shifts the thinking and it puts responsibility on us as an educational system and not the student for not learning the material. So that being said, with all the adjustment to practice work, we are um, monitoring progress and this year we're really specializing our progress monitoring reporting so that it's individualized in alignment with our work. So in the past, as you can see, this would be the statement that we would have on the progress reports. Very general, very cookie cutter. It is anticipated that you know, student X will meet this goal by the end of the IEP period. This is an example of what we're doing to make it individual and specific. We're looking at individual student, student needs according to their IEP goals and objectives, and then we're calling out exactly what the student needs to work on, the skill set, what we're doing about it, and how, what the, the type of progress we, we expect to see at the end of that period. Um, our data in special education is both quantitative and qualitative in nature. We're using multiple measures of assessment, as Meredith and Dave so nicely outlined, but we're also using qualitative measures as well, some of that is formative in nature, um, with, with the end of the um, period summaries from our related service providers, as well as summative in nature with the work that they're doing. 
Um, and I just want to add our, our related service providers are also doing the adjustment to practice work so it's not limited specifically to ELA math or content experts. Our related service providers are also adjusting their practice um, in accordance with the students IEP goals and objectives so we can have a measurability there as well. So thank you. Yep. And I know there's more to come. Mm -hmm. um, that was just a little little glimpse of all of the work that you've been doing, and we will definitely schedule that once we figure out when our meetings are going to be. Sure. Um, so uh, basically sharing progress with families. I alluded to this earlier. Um, and these are the many ways in which we have been sharing information um, this year. Uh, really thinking about, in the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the CPR feedback that I shared at CPAC, um, this problem of perception based on a disconnect between assumptions that are being made and, and, and practice that's happening. And I believe that a big part of that is communication and doing being able to provide information so that parents can interpret the results that they get at home and can understand what we're doing on an individual basis for students. Um, so we're working, we've, we've begun that work um, and we have plans to make it even more accessible. I know that um, at the middle school they're going to be going to an open grade book much as they have at the high school, um, which is a very new practice. Um, but the, the, the discussion that we had in the CPR, this is, this is preliminary. I know I've already talked with the school committee about this, but it felt that it fit into this presentation. Um, there are great things going on. They've been identified and reinforced through our review process. We did hear back, and we, sh we're, we're, we should know any, and get an actual report um, any day now. Um, but they pointed out things like the exemplary social emotional support available to students in this district. And we know this feels really great when we hear it from somebody who goes across the state and, and has that benchmark in their minds. Um, they identified a tiered system of support. Um, and the fact that we were, we were very proactive in self-evaluating our, our second language learner program and making making adjustments that had already resulted in significant improvement before they even came to visit. Um, we just knew that this was an area that needed improving. Um, we also knew that we had many more students needing second language services um, in our district than we'd had in the past. Um, and then, you know, they also acknowledged the dedicated staff who really know their students. And they had many, many interviews while they were here in the district. Um, the, the one, and I, didn't, I did not skip it on purpose, I wanted to come back to it at the end, this problem of perception, those were the words that they used for us, between the concerns that had been shared with them in reviewing and what they saw is taking place in our schools. And again, I, I think we need to work to call it out and to make, um, to celebrate it, to make it available to people, to make people feel that they can, um, they can have opportunities to observe perhaps, uh, but, but we feel that this is something that in our next strategic plan, we're really going to want to address um, so that, that folks understand all the great things that are taking place. And that we identify the areas where we need to improve, which we, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of doing that. So I think that that's, it, we can only improve if we, if we acknowledge the areas where we, where we need to do so. Um, and we put this slide in, and Mr. Shog I, I don't understand Italy, but Mr. Ghosh is currently in Italy. Mr. Dumas is leaving for there. We wanted to put this on because I know that there will be a technology, um, a full technology report for the school committee, um, but just the tremendous amount of work that's going to, that's already taken place on behalf of Mr. Ghosh and his department, and actually it's affected everybody because everybody's been part of reviewing the different the different potential providers um, there's been hours and hours of work that have gone into it and that's just the beginning because it's going to end up being just as a little um, uh, preview for you uh, a, a, a real strategic plan focus at least for some departments and when I come back for the next meeting and we talk about suggestions or a preliminary discussion around where we are um, we've really tried to as we have in the past call out specific goals and then primary responsibility so that we're not overlapping, so that people know what their focus should be, and so that we can feel that the, the varied areas are being addressed um, by attaching roles and responsibilities to the different initiatives. Um, so now it's your turn. Any questions for any of our presenters? I did have one question, just a clarification on the student success plans. Now, are those being used um, 
exclusively for kids on IEPs or will they be used? Okay. No, they're for any student who's at risk for not keeping up or not making, not closing up any gaps that exist, okay. even if they're gen ed gaps. They could be um, behavior uh, related, not behavior as in, um, not, in other words, uh, like student who has a hard time attending in class or um, being able to get up and move around during the classroom period because they can't sit that long. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So it could be anything. Yeah, in the data analysis meetings that Dave and Meredith spoke about, uh, the special educators also meet. Uh, they, we have building-based meetings, that's what we call them, but it's the same idea. We're meeting, we're analyzing data, we're going through the data points, we're coming up with some ways to remediate and also to enhance our instructional practices. Um, and you'll hear more in my next presentation about the resource inventory guide and how that relates. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to add to for the rest of the committee that the liaison report that I gave earlier and I was misunderstanding that we were actually doing most of the presentation that we did at CPAC. So you actually have seen tonight a yeah. lot of the presentation that was at CPAC, mm -hmm. if not all of it. Um, and I wasn't, that's my fault for not realizing that was tonight. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that what, what I saw last Tuesday, you just saw here, so. Is this K-12? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. As none of the examples were younger kids, but it is happening across the board. Yeah. Okay. So when they get into middle school and high school, you do it at the individual classes, like you go into an by English team. class or, or by yeah. team. Yeah. Okay. So classroom uh, level teams, and then any associated specialists that work with that team, maybe ad hoc if they're working on particular skills uh, or academic areas with that student. And in many cases, uh, the guidance, members of the guidance department will also be part of those meetings. Okay. All right. And I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Um, I was in a first grade classroom today that I went to acknowledge um, every single child in this classroom that you've heard us talking about since the beginning of the year who were purposefully placed in the classroom because they were all below grade readers had all achieved benchmark or beyond. So I went today to celebrate them, um, and the teachers had provided me. So when you look at the first two pages, this is the same child, September and May. Um, and I won't ask you to read it, but, um, but it, is, does, it is the same sentence, repeated. <laughs> um, and you just can see the incredible um, growth that's happened through this SRSD writing program that we have in place now in two buildings um, and it will be moving into both the Hopkins and middle school next year. Um, so we're very excited and Meredith, thank you for your work in bringing that in and in, in, in making sure that it went, went forward. Um, so these, you can, you can go home and enjoy them, but the, it's just, it's, this is where it begins. We know that it begins here. So um, thank you all, thank you for, oh sorry John. Uh -huh. um, so thank you. Um, so first and foremost, I, I would like to say thank you because this is something that I know we've, I know Dr. McLeod, you and I have had conversations about this. It, it, assessment is a big topic within the community. People want to know what we're doing with all of these assessments that we're doing. This was a really thorough presentation and I <laughs> hope everybody watched because I think it, it did a lot. I, I learned a lot. Um, one question I had, there's, a, what I really like is there's a lot of great target setting. In, in the especially in the individual level but in the one aggregated slide where we looked at those um, those classes for instance so I'm curious about target setting at those growth levels and if there's anything done on that because I think um, mr. Youngberg the the example you pulled out was I, I definitely understand you might see a, a smaller growth percentage in a class that starts out higher but e even in that very slide that particular class grew less than others that started at the same level and mm -hmm. so there can be a million extenuating factors to that but I'm curious about what what target setting and then what we do with that when we see those overall the larger trends in, in that data example when we look at grade levels or school level data that also uh, brings up other questions and we want to ask ourselves um, are we calibrating our scoring of that data correctly mm -hmm. are are the rubrics um, are we using the common rubrics and expectations? Um, so those are other questions and work that's going on in the periphery, okay. um, which brings up uh, the need for having common assessments so that a student in class A would have this, we expect them, um, that, that particular classroom instructor um, to be 
implementing the same common core standards in every single classroom. So we want to make sure that we're doing that effectively in each of our classes. So that's another piece that the school administrators and teachers look at when we look at those larger overall trends in data. Um, and we also look at comparisons. Um, so when we look at benchmarks, the benefit of looking at benchmark data is it gives us a comparison to other um, third grade students throughout uh, the United States, for example, have taken that assessment. So it gives us um, a, uh, a place marker where, where we can evaluate ourselves against the general population. The other thing we do with that data at the, at the school level, in addition to everything Dave just said, is we share the information with teachers and in our PLCs, in our professional learning communities, teachers come together to talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what's different, and what, are, what am I doing differently? Principals provide opportunities for teachers to get into each other's classrooms um, and to collaborate on you know, things that, uh, on a particular unit where a group of kids might have struggled, sharing, and I've said in you know, many, many of those, of those meetings where they're sharing str strategies, they're sharing ideas, they're regrouping. Um, and so it's the beginnings of a conversation to be able to call out the data and then say, okay, what, what's, what's the difference between, and it, sometimes it's, as Dave says, sometimes it's um, the, the particular class of students that might have greater needs. And so we want to make sure as administrators that if that's the case, we make sure that that group of students is receiving whatever additional supports that they need. Um, and it could be programmatic. Um, it, could be, it could be that you're comparing one classroom that happened to be a co-taught class with a class that is not, that's good. Sure. So we look at all of those factors, but the, the, the most important piece is that the data is a starting point of a discussion around what are we going to do globally as a school, and then what are we going to do individually within the classroom. And the range of student needs can be different from class to class. So you may have um, a particular class that may have a range from level A all the way up through level N. In another class, you might have a range from level A all the, you know, to level D. So in those cases, it makes it much more challenging. So we're looking at flexible grouping options um, to enable teachers to really focus their instruction based on what those student needs are. So uh, students in one classroom might switch to another class um, for uh, a targeted skill set. It might only be for one unit or it might be um, just for one or two days to get some extra instructional strategies and um, so that's also how some of that information is used to be able to do some of that flexible grouping. Yeah, that's a really great point too in terms of those, those numbers look exactly the same but the distribution of students within that could cause it, a lot of students might grow and still it might not pull that average over if there are a couple outliers that's right. mm -hmm. that's a good point no I th thank you for that clarification I think seeing that all those dimensions that you use to kind of delve into those root causes and the collaboration is really great so I, I again I really appreciate this presentation mm -hmm. great. so if I could um, just add in uh, first I want to say that this is what we've been talking about since you came to the district and so I think it's very consistent with what you've been telling us we need to be moving towards and it's I mean we were seeing it in your evidence folder we're seeing it here in this presentation so I just want to say I know this was a tremendous amount of work and kind of a shift in culture here so this is a lot of progress in a short period of time and I think I hope that people watching and I'm sure there are many um, are taking away from this uh, this is a tremendously specific data on every student in our district which is again what what we call for in our strategic plan but it's a very high bar so that's a lot of work and I think what's particularly um, important about that in the midst of a lot of angst and discussion around MCAS versus um, you know versus the next generation of whatever that's going to be uh, this is apples to apples what our standards are with our students and all of those things are also tracked and, and all of that but this is how we know the progress that our kids are making in a very short time span and it's just real time and constant evaluation and so I know again there is a lot of talk around a lot of testing but I, I think I hope that people are seeing the value of that testing um, and the immediate the translation of that into impacting the way that the students are receiving the services and I think Meredith you said it or one of you did that uh, maybe Karen it was it, it's really a shift in mindset around it's a it's um, 
need it, it calls for a greater look at the instruction as opposed to the student effort or both obviously are important so I just wanted to compliment all of you on that and I and I um, wanted to ask if you can clarify a little bit the role that this plays in this the teacher evaluation process mm -hmm. and goal setting and um, and so forth how the data if this data is used in that process it, it absolutely is um, and and that's a great question and a great segue to you know discussing how student growth um, is affected on teacher evaluation which is something that hot off the press is looking like they're voting it if not today tomorrow um, to, to go away from that mm -hmm. um, because it didn't it didn't have the intended outcomes more importantly being able to work with teachers to self set goals mm -hmm. that where they've identified I mean this this system has been new for all of us right and to call out that thing that we need to work on that we're weakest in is a hard thing to do mm -hmm. so as administrators we're doing it we're asking teachers to do the same and some of it is data is the data doesn't lie so mm -hmm. if there are areas where they need additional support or they need additional training or it's something that they want to work with colleagues on sometimes it's a team goal um, it's very much aligned with goal setting and thus the evaluation system Great. thank you so the only question I have is are we posting this? I know we talked about it last week at the CPAC meeting, but are we the posting CPAC the presentation? The CPAC presentation is posted. It's yes. on the website. Okay. Um, and we will add this one, just in case it has any little. Great. Yeah, just to clarify, Lori, that this is mostly the presentation from CPAC, that just a couple missing pieces of the resource inventory and ESY instructional plans. Right. But it can be absolutely viewed online. Happy to answer any questions and come back to the table to clarify, maybe show you some evidence if you'd like. And it is on the home page. It did get posted there. So oh, great. this CPAC presentation. Excellent. Yes. Very good. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great quint question. Okay. So we are you, you all <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um we'll be moving on to new business and our first We need that, right? Yes. <laughs> Our first, um, missing my thoughts here, we're looking to vote to ratify the Memorandum of Understanding with the Hopkinton Teachers, Teachers Association, Unit C, Nurses Association. Um, so I will be s seeking a motion well, I'm sorry, I'm messing this up a little bit here. You're doing great. Um, so we're, what we're considering here is the re request and recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee vote to ratify the MOU with the HTA Unit C Nurses Association. And I would seek a motion to approve the vote to ratify the MOU with the HTA Unit C Nurses Association. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Knight, and this requires a roll call vote. Ms. Birchman? Yes. Ms. Cavanaugh? Yes. Mr. Gargiano? Yes. Ms. Knight? Yes. And I am a yes as well, and it's unanimous and so carries. Next is our vote to ratify the MOU with the Association of Cafeteria Workers. For our consideration, it's a request and recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee vote to ratify the MOU with the Association of Cafeteria Workers. The recommended motion before you is, and I will seek a motion to approve the vote to ratify the Memorandum of Understanding with the Association of Cafeteria Workers. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, second by Ms. Knight, and this also requires a roll call vote. Ms. Richmond? Yes. Ms. Cavanaugh? Yes. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Ms. Knight? Yes. And I am a yes as well, and it's unanimous and so carries. The next item on our agenda is School Committee Policy KHB Advertising in the Schools. Um, so we had been started this conversation. Um, interestingly enough, it came up when we were looking to replace the scoreboard. Um, at the high school, um, which was in your packet, and in which I have a you know uh, illustration of, of what's being proposed for next year, and in the illustration um, there is an opportunity for advertising. Thank you um, for more than one. Um, 
potential, this is a potential source of revenue. Mm -hmm. That it seems that since this policy was written in 2007, um, we haven't taken advantage of as a revenue source. And so when we brought it in initially as, a, as kind of looking at advertising, when we looked at it more carefully, it became very clear that we were supposed to be looking at potentially reviewing the rates over time. And um, in speaking with Mr. Dumas, this is just something that hasn't been done. It kind of speaks to your point earlier, Jean, in terms of keeping on top of the policies that should be reviewed, you know, frequently and et cetera, having somebody have their lens on that. Mm -hmm. um, so tonight we wanted to talk about the, the policy in general, if there were suggestions around um, any changes, but then um, we do need to designate, sorry, somewhere, oh here, the last paragraph. The superintendent, in conjunction with the school committee, will set advertising rates for school and school district advertising. So there may be other places in addition to the high school scoreboard, but it seems that given that we are replacing it, there are going to be two, and each scoreboard has two different spaces that could potentially have, or one, sorry, one, one on each. So one would have the Hiller's logo, and the other could be used for advertising. Um, the history, I'd, I had asked Ralph to just provide a, just an overview, um, if, you would, sure. if you would, Mr. Dumas. Um, so during my six years here, the district has generated no revenue from advertising. My assistant, Debbie, has been here for 15 years, and she wasn't aware of any advertising either. So I contacted, um, um, his name is escaping me, Brian Thomas from Phipps Insurance Agency to ask him, uh, what was the deal with the uh, scoreboard and <laughs> he said that um, when the scoreboard was installed uh, the agency paid a flat fee of five thousand um, dollars to defray the cost of the uh, scoreboard and that was it there was never any um, start and end period involved with it he also indicated to me that uh, he, he understands that <clears throat> we're going to be removing that scoreboard and in, they're interested in uh, continuing the, the partnership uh, through a, a renegotiation. I've That's also sent an, worth, I yeah, think, yeah, I, I guess he has. So I, I sent an email out to my colleagues uh, around the state today asking if anybody um, ha does generate any substantial revenue from advertising what they're allowing and what their rates are. So far, I haven't received anything. Um, I will point out to you that we do have the right to advertise on our school buses. Um, but I don't know that the community would like to see <laughs> advertising on our school buses. But I just throw it out there because there are some communities that actually do that. It's not like your 2016 walking zone. <laughs> sure. And my daycare fee. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> But John, thank you for remembering that. <laughs> I, I still have that, and I will never throw that away. So, okay. um, I am certain that there are some questions and discussion for this one. Um, does anyone want to start? Can I? Ask, so, I have a a question about the policy, and then I have a question about the process of what we're trying to do tonight. So, I'll do them in reverse order. So, you just mentioned something about we need to also. Um, set advertising rates and designate how funds may be expended. We're not anticipating doing that tonight, right? Right. Okay, good. Just wanted to clarify. Um, the policy as written talks a lot about that the purpose of advertising is to raise funds. I know it says not to promote public discourse. We, we do a lot of advertising on the tennis courts in particular. Right. And so, and we don't charge for that, right? Right, those are largely community events, and right. I, I know that they do go through, you know, a, some 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 level of scrutiny in terms of what can be posted there and what cannot. Nancy, do you know more about it? You seem I, to I, be. I know, for example, the um, town election is. Oh, that banner always goes up there. It has to go through. Uh, it used to be Lisa Carty. I think it's somebody else now that does it. But Alice Department. Okay, sorry. Uh, it, it has to be approved, I believe, for both content and also what the organization that's supporting it mm -hmm. is. Like you, mm -hmm. It couldn't be like a Hopkinton Drug, for example, or right. a business right. type of thing couldn't put it up and advertise in that way. That. So 
which the policy definitely has the open discretion piece. I guess wh I, which I'm okay with. I guess I would just make want to make sure that nobody thinks that are we is this policy in and of itself make it a problem that we let those advertisements happen for free? And do we need to put something in here that allows we for the discretion of whether or not we charge we based do. on certain factors? Yeah. Because I, I think that would be, um, it, it doesn't, the, the, we talked a lot, you talked a lot about the scoreboard, but this doesn't talk about the scoreboard. This talks about any advertising yeah. on the school thing grounds. Is, is that being that the district has not to this point set rates, and obviously you have this one singular case where we did receive funds, but they were used to offset the, the, side, the scoreboard. It would seem to me that in your setting of rates, you would decide if community events are a no charge. So in your setting of rates, you could delineate that. I, I don't disagree with that. I just want to make sure we do something to account for that. I, I don't want to, I, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we could even, I mean, you could even parse yeah. out the different venues of advertising. You could say that the mm -hmm. tennis court fence is for community events only and mm -hmm. is free of charge. Mm -hmm. I just, I, as I said, I just want to make sure that we don't, put this policy in, set a rate, and then look back on this in a year and mm -hmm. somebody asks why, well, I, I want to put my banner up there and I'll mm -hmm. pay you for it according to the policy. So I, I just want to make sure that we're accounting for that. Okay. So I was not on the school committee, if you can believe that, when this policy <laughs> was voted. However, I was the president of the PTA and I was um, involved in the discussion and I can tell you, first of all, that there was a lot of discussion about advertising on the buses and that was oh. resoundingly rejected. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think, you know, the um, the general, this also came about at a time where I believe the term was million dollar babies. They were looking for a lot of ways, this were back in the days where we were talking about a 0.75% increase to the budget. And so they were looking everywhere they could for alternative <coughs> sources of revenue. And so um, clearly the policy was put in place, hasn't really been taken advantage of in the ensuing years um, with, with this one exception. Um, so what I, my preference would be that this doesn't seem to be a pressing need at the moment. Um, I would suggest that when we finalize our uh, strategy regarding how we're gonna manage policies this year, we put this on the forefront, but I personally would like to see advertising policies from other districts. I would like to see advertising rates from other districts. And I think in the spirit of um, <laughs> sustainability, we need to develop an agreement that an advertising, you know, that a, that a business would sign with us so that there is some tracking and you don't have to be as old as I am to remember what happened, how, I don't even know how many years ago that was, nine years ago. So. Um, so I think we need to put all of those things in place before we can really take a vote on this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my preference um, going forward. And I think, you know, I think there definitely is a distinction between putting up, you know, a banner that says town meeting is Monday versus, you know, buy Pepsi. It, there's a distinction. And so we need to clarify that probably better in here. But in addition, I think we added a policy around um, putting leaflets on cars in the parking lot. That should certainly be cross-referenced, so we need to take a look at what else we've done in the meantime that um, corresponds to this, okay? But I like the new school. Okay, <laughs> anybody else? Okay, I just wanted to, so I, the, you took the words out of my mouth with agreement, Jean, because I mean, there's, that's an easy way to track, and it also is an easy way to put a start and end date and what the expectations are. And in addition, um, mm -hmm. it also allows you to document what what the advertisement looks like so that it, when you've approved it, if it changes from that, it can mm -hmm. alter it. Um, so I, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, the other, I mean, the other piece, I guess, Dr. McLeod, is that this did go out for public comment. Correct. And we did receive feedback from, I believe, just one individual. Right. Um, it wasn't clear to Dr. McLeod and I whether or not it was directly on point with this particular policy. Um, or whether it had more to do with fundraising. Right. Um, the, certainly, um, Leanne brought up great points in terms of, you know, 
things that we ought to be looking at in our schools around, and this is not the first time I've heard it this year, this is the fifth or sixth time I've heard it this year, which is the sense that in some way our children are being used to fundraise um, in a way that they don't understand. And the idea was that the parent might want to contribute to that particular organization, but when kids are involved in um, needing to do whatever they're asked to do, um, there, there's a level of discomfort with that. It feels to me like it's separate from advertising. It, it's not to say that we shouldn't be taking it up, and we should be, but it does feel like it's more of a, an administrative um, discussion that, that I should be having, and it, it also feels like it's really targeting one school at this particular point. So, you know, my approach would probably be more to follow up with that, that individual school to have a better understanding of how it works and whether or not there are changes that, that need to happen going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally think that what happened was that the policy went out and the parent was reminded of a concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the concern was sent to us because mm -hmm. it's a viable concern, mm -hmm. but it, it didn't it didn't seem directly on it didn't give any recommendations on changes to the advertising policy um, but it did target the one school and I agree like I think that that it, it, it's it's separate from the policy not that it shouldn't she's be here. dealt with but it should it's it's you know she's well, in I, the think, audience. I think that the salient point is how do you define advertising because I think depending on your perspective that absolutely does qualify and so you know it may be that that if, if we determine that that doesn't fall under the umbrella of advertising that we need to take a look at fundraising and we certainly do that in every building across the district um, and so that would be a broader conversation and and probably a related one um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree it would be broader because it has come up not with that particular fundraiser, but with other fundraisers in other buildings in other years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is true. I remember one at the Hopkins School recently. Mm -hmm. Okay. It wasn't all fundraising, though. It was also partially advertising. Yes, you're right. As curriculum. You're right. Yep. Okay. So. so broader discussion, but outside of policy is what I'm hearing. Well, well it potentially, may, it, it may, may make its way back to policy. Yeah, which think would be actually great. Yeah, I think I think there's probably the aspiration to think about okay. codifying its policy is probably okay. good. Okay, very good. Okay, so we're not taking any action on this policy tonight. No, right. Okay, All right, we will move on to the school physician's contract. Um, Dr. McLeod, did you want to speak to this or should I? No, it's very straightforward. Okay. Um, for your consideration, it's a request and recommendation of the superintendent that we approve the school physician's contract for the 2016-2017 school year, which includes a 2% increase. Were there any questions on the motion or discussion about the contract overall? Okay. I would seek a motion to approve the school physician's contract as provided in our agenda. Did we get the school contract, actually? Am I making that yeah, up? Yeah, we did. It's in the Sorry. It's in there. I remember reading the packet. Um, as it's provided in the agenda materials. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano's, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Can I just make one request and that we take her? If this is posted, take her social security number, tax ID out of it. I don't, I don't know. We'll I do. Thank you, Jean. Um, this probably should come off the contract in general, because the contract's a public document, right? Pardon me? Probably should come off the contract in general. Posted right. or unposted because it's a public document. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay. We'll be on it first okay. thing in the morning. Thanks. All right. The next item in our agenda is the F1 visa enrollment update and the approval of the funding al allocation. So I am here on Mr. Uh, in fact, I told Mr. Bishop that I would take this up, but you do have um, a memo that was in the packet from him explaining um, not only the additional uh, revenue, but, but recommendation on how the breakdown would um, be expended. Um, are there any questions 
Any discussion around or, or clarifi clarifying questions around what he's proposing? I know this is a follow-up to, Nancy, you weren't here yet, but they came and you might have even been watching. Um, just to, we had a discussion around, is there a cap on the number of students that we can bring in? Um, and really the cap was more, can we find enough families to host? Um, it's been just a wonderful program, a wonderful addition to our high school, and we've just had great kids um, that, have, that have been part of it. Uh, the enthusiasm, because I always, I always sit back and think, you're taking on additional work. <laughs> um, the enthusiasm for the program is infectious, uh, and I just appreciate the, um, the extra effort on, on the part of the administration at the high school um, to, to take this on. We think the recommendation um, in terms of the um, how the funds would be expended make make good sense, Mr. Dumas. Yep. And so it is here for your consideration and um, approval. Any questions or discussion? Okay. Not for me. So I would seek a motion to approve the recommended expenditure. Um, of the F-1 visa account, it should have said. Um, the SF of the F-1 visa um, account as indicated in the agenda materials. So moved. Second. A motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. No. Next item on our agenda is capital project article warrant number 16-069 in the amount of $4,411.99. Mr. Dumas. Um, I'm assuming that you've read the memo, and if so, uh, there are four, um, four invoice, invoices, two from DCM controls and two to reimburse Bruce Elliott, who's our uh, K-12 wellness coordinator who expended money out of pocket with advance approval uh, to purchase some um, equipment. Both of these are related to uh, the school safety and security article appropriated as Article 24 of the May 2015 annual town meeting, and we recommend that these items be approved for payment by the school committee. Are there any questions on the motion before you? Okay. Um, I would seek a motion to approve the payment of warrant number 16-069 in the amount of $4,411.99 to the vendors as outlined in the warrant. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and it's okay. And the next item on our agenda is the roof replacement contract award, Mr. Dumas. Okay, um, so you received a roof replacement memo uh, and backup at the beginning of the meeting. Um, the bid opening was held yesterday. Time is of the essence. This really couldn't wait uh, for a follow-up uh, school committee meeting uh, because we want to get the work done during the summertime. So uh, Dr. McLeod and I reviewed this uh, memo today and she's asked me to um, to spend some time going over the salient points because there really are a lot of them uh, with this particular procurement. So the background is that in May of 2015, um, we were appropriated $1,114,000 for the project, including engineering. The price was predicated on a partial replacement of the Hopkins school roof and repairs to designated areas at the high school including the area with solar panels. That would be the gymnasium. It was specifically noted in Guild's study report that removal of the solar panels uh, was not part of their estimate as it would result in a significant cost increase. I left something out that uh, Gale Associates was hired by the school committee last, a year ago, last winter, to, to take a look at the existing condition of the two roofs, come up with some recommendations and give us an idea of how much it would cost. So in late February of this year, the school committee <coughs> awarded the contract to engineer the project to Gill Associates. That cost $92,000, which leaves a balance of $1,022,000 for the construction. <coughs> Since that time, we've had several meetings and other communications regarding the damage caused to the gymnasium roof by the installation of the solar panels and the best way to deal with it. 
The meetings have included representatives from the solar panel company, that's BCC, Gale Associates, Town Council Ramirez, Town Manager Norman Kamalo, Superintendent McLeod, Al Rogers, and myself. To date, despite town, town Council's efforts, BC continues to accept no financial responsibility for the roof damage. And they've actually stated that there are no apparent problems that would justify consideration of replacing the roof at this time. They suggest that we undertake minor repairs to, re to solve the problems. However, based on conversations that we've had with Gale Associates, the school department and the town believes that the wisest course of action is to remove the solar panels before replacing the entire gymnasium roof. This would result in significant costs that far exceed the appropriation. So the matter continues to be in the hands of town council. Um, there, there was today, uh, most recently, Gale Associates finalized their comments for inclusion in the letter that is going, the demand letter that's going from Mayors and Harrington to BCC. So yesterday, we conducted a public bid opening for the purpose of determining the low bidder for the project. The way the bid was structured was that we have a base bid that includes all the work at the high school except the gymnasium and the portion of the Hopkins roof that was identified as the most needy. That's the west side. I'll, when I finish this, I'll show you. We've got the pictures with the color coding as, as to exactly what's going to be done. Um, we did it that way and if, uh, so that if the bids came in lower than projected, uh, we had four alternate scopes of work specified with the lowest ranked alternates being for the repairs to the gym roof. State bid laws require awarding authorities to accept alternates only in the order that they were ranked in the bid. So we cannot award the high school gymnasium work, which is alternates three and four, before awarding the extra Hopkins roof work, alternates one and two. However, you can only do the base bid tonight, and that's what we're, we're recommending. And then um, if we decide that we're gonna do something with the high school roof, uh, we can rebid it uh, with just the high school roof, or we can um, negotiate a change order with the, the low bidder. The low bidder was low no matter what alternates were, were included, so we wouldn't be violating anything. So we did receive four seal bids, um, all certified by the state to undertake the project. Uh, Gale Associates has uh, a lot of experience with the low bidder, Greenwood Industries of Worcester, and they're very comfortable recommending that we award the contract to them. And there, here you see the base bids, the base plus alternate one, the base plus alternates one and two, et cetera, et cetera. So Greenwood uh, is the low bidder. So although the remaining appropriation of a million twenty-two can cover the costs of alternate one at the Hopkins School, it's our opinion that we should only do the work associated with the base bid and maintain the $198,000 balance until the disagreement with BCC is resolved or we decide to move forward with repairs to the gymnasium roof because ultimately we need to protect our asset. The work associated with alternate one is currently not critical. Therefore, we recommend that the school committee award the contract for the Hopkins and High School Roof Project at a cost of $824,000 with funding available in the, in the roof article account. So if we go to page three, which is the drawing of the Hopkins School, everything in yellow is the base bid. The areas on the uh, outside of that roof are shingle, and the areas in the middle where the HVAC equipment is are um, e EPDM. Right, Al? EPDM? Yes, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. I always say EDPM. So the pink areas and the blue areas are what are called four towers. Those are shingled. And the pink ones, uh, one of them you don't actually see on this picture. It's the front of the building, the entrance. And the other one is, you know, to, to the left of the entrance in this picture. Um, and the other two, uh, uh, are, the, are the blue ones, the other two, two towers. Those are alt alternates one and two. Um, all, none of those alternates are critical uh, right now. 
uh, the likelihood is that we'll get another five years out of them. Okay? And obviously, there are other uh, roof areas uh, on the eastern side, um, flat roof areas, uh, th those are not in need of repair. Those are in good condition. The, um, the main reason that um, they're doing the EPDM um, low slope roof is because there's going to be a tremendous amount of work on that when they're doing the, the shingles. Um, and they did find some ponding in that area and some, um, some squishy insulation, technical jargon. <laughs> and they'll be, they'll be replacing those skylights that you see there uh, on, on, the, uh, on the picture. Okay? Now, the high school, the picture's a little bit smaller. Uh, I did the best I could to blow it up, but uh, again, the yellow is the base bid. Um, it's all EPDM roof. There's no shingle roof being replaced at the high school. All of the areas that are not highlighted are shingled roofs that are in good condition. Uh, never part of the appropriation and not part of, of the bid. And not impacted by solar, right? And not impacted by solar. The pink is alternates three and four. Um, a tiny little piece of that is alternate four. Um, alternates three and four. Um, and just so that we're clear, the, at the high school, the EPDM roofs are not being replaced. It, it's unnecessary. It's the, the seam areas that are being repaired. They'll put new seams, weld new seams, where the pieces of uh, roofing material come together, all new flashing, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and the, when, when we did alternates three and four, um, over the gymnasium, that was to do some uh, what they call stripping of the seams and to, uh, to shore up um, what's, what they're calling boots where the penetrations are uh, from the solar panels. So at this point in time, um, I, I just think this is the right thing to do. Um, and we hold our, you know, keep our options open keep the $198,000 that's been appropriated, um, and at some point in time, it will be used for the high school roof. And we can carry that, right? And there's we can no, carry that no forward. Time limit on that. Yep, there's no time limit. Does the, do we own the solar panels? No. Or is it a lease? So are we allowed no. well, to remove them? Uh, oh, we, we uh, effectively, we, I use the term rent the right. roof to, okay. to BCC. But it's usually a term of a... 20 years. And we are at Seven or eight years into it now. So are we allowed to remove those? No. Or is there like a lease <coughs> impact? If well, we if we remove them, a couple of things. If, if we permanently remove them, uh -huh. we would have to buy them out. And there's, there's a, a, a fee structure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's quite expensive. Right. Uh, and it includes not only... The, fee, the, the buyout includes... Uh, it's a, a one number that includes the high school, the middle school, the fire department, and the police department. Oh. So it's not all broken out. This was all done as one, one initiative. Okay. So if we were to unilaterally remove those, mm -hmm. even temporarily, uh, we would likely um, owe BCC money because they wouldn't be generating electricity. And we would lose whatever offset we get from... And we would lose whatever yeah. offset we get. And so it's very responsible for the, the removal, of safety, yeah. right. storage of those panels right. and, and replacement. Right. And you wouldn't want to put those panels back on that right. roof. No. no. Right. So it's a very, very complicated yeah, uh, undertaking that we're hoping to get BCC to... Um, help us with. And I just would like to say, Ralph, that you've taken a very complicated situation and undertaking and made it very clear. I appreciate all of the work that you've done um, in preparing the this. I love the color coding. Like it it speaks to my um, <laughs> okay. uh, my understanding go. of roofs. Right. Um, and Al, for <laughs> of course, all your help. But we've had many, many meetings since since town meeting of 2015. Um, where where that question arose around you know what about insurance and so um, I just I think that this is incredibly thorough and um, it is very helpful in, in in having the school committee make their decision 
Who else has questions? I do, but. Um, so, a couple things. I don't see reference in here to Borrego. Isn't that who installed it? But Borrego sold it to BCC. Okay. That was part of that long ago. Okay. Uh, that, that, what do you call it when they assign? They assign, assign. assign yeah. the contract. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so just so I understand the color coding. What, what you're recommending is that we do the yellow portion of the Hopkins map. And the yellow portion of the high school. And the yellow portion of the high school. The pink and blue portions of the Hopkins map. Not we are do. not, you're not recommending that we do that. And you estimate we get another five years. Right. Out of those, both well, of those areas? We couldn't do the blue because we couldn't afford to do the blue. Okay. Because, uh, as you can see at the bottom of the memo on the first page, base plus alternates one and two is a million one fifty four, mm -hmm. and we only have a million twenty two. Right. So the most we could do would be the base and alternate one, mm -hmm. but that would only give us about thirty or thirty five thousand uh, dollars to do anything at the high school, right? Uh, on the gymnasium. Okay. And then, um, so the repairs to the gymnasium roof, if I did my back of the envelope math correctly, is that's like, if that's three and four, that's about $64,000 on that's this correct. estimate. Okay, and so we're not, and so obviously we need to postpone that until the litigation is resolved, one way or the other, or potential litigation. Un unless uh, something bad were to happen. Okay. so. So my questions then are, one, what do we anticipate our ongoing maintenance costs to be in the high school gymnasium if we're not making these repairs now? That's why, the, yeah. that's why we're recommending not doing the um, pink and the blue because we want to be able to have some additional, Gail is recommending to us that in the absence of full replacement, we should in the bare minimum do some, do some repairs. So um, we are going to do the repairs to the, I thought, I'm sorry, I thought the recommendation was to not do the repairs to the high school roof. At this time. At this time. As part of this contract. Right. Be because it would, it would seem, um, poor choice of words, foolish to spend money that maybe BCC will end up paying. Right. However, if that yeah. doesn't get resolved in a timely right. fashion and we're faced with going into another winter mm -hmm. with ongoing concerns about the condition of the roof, we'll be coming back to have this conversation, a further conversation right. because um, yep. we didn't want to spend money on temporary repairs. We wanted to be mm -hmm. able to do, a, to do a complete replacement. But because we're having these ongoing um, conversations about who's going to take responsibility for the damages, we haven't been able to make that kind of a commitment. We don't have that much money appropriated, um, but we do want to be aware of ongoing damages that could be caused, for example, to our gym floor as a mm. result of leaks, or not knowing where the, what do they call it? When it leaks and then it, the lot where it runs off. There's a, there's a term that BCC used today when they were writing to us about doing a leak analysis to see where the runoff uh, yeah okay to see yeah. where the flow goes the flow you know, whatever i mean there are things that we you know even yeah. though we might know the source of the leak we might not know what damages mm -hmm. we could be incurring under the roof mm -hmm. and uh we want to minimize that so so what we're asking for is to buy some time mm -hmm. because there is time between now and the winter which is the most likely period that this is going to cause a problem mm -hmm. uh, to let the legal process work its way out and I, I don't you know. object to that I guess yeah. I have a couple of concerns one is that in my uh, limited experience with the legal process much less than Lori it doesn't move that quickly right. number two you know we've had many years in my experience here where we've had actually to postpone the opening of school because of hurricane force winds and that you know so the winter isn't the only time that we experience damage in our high school i get that all of that it's just sure. we're going to have to make the, our our best decision based on the information that we have now but i think um what i'm leading up to is what is the um if 
what is the loss of the economy of scale of doing all of this at the same time? So calling the people back mm -hmm. to do additional work, does that, in does that increase these costs because it's, a, you know, it's a second project under the same umbrella, basically? Intellectually, the, the answer to that is yes. The reality of it is it depends. It depends when the bid is done. You know, if you, bid a roof, if you bid a summer roof job in February, you're probably going to get a better price than if you bid a, a, a summer roof job in, in May. Okay. So, so, so can I just jump on to that, Jean? Because I have a question that's like directly related to that, and then I'll let you mm -hmm. finish because I have a bunch of other questions. But the thing that doesn't make any sense to me is you're waiting for the legal process to go through its process, which I wholeheartedly agree is not going to happen by the winter. Um, just in my experience because even a demand letter you give 30 days to respond and then it, you haven't even gotten into litigation yet so my question is regardless of when you like if you choose to spend the money and fix that port now you then have a bill that demonstrates exactly what the school's damages are that BCC you're saying is responsible for. I, I understand that completely. Tonight, you cannot award a contract that includes the high school gym right. because your appropriation's not big enough. What you can do is award only the base and then a little bit down the road. Great, but you said you that there's a, a portion contract. that Gene was talking about that was $64,000, and you're saying there's 198000 you, you have to award have them in order. Yeah. You have, you have to award, award alternate one and two before you can award alternate three and four. That's three and four. Right. So, so that's three and four, so we, yeah. we have to do Hopkins before we can yeah, award. Yeah, see, uh, we would love to be able to do it all, you know, even if there was no uh, if there was no litigation involved. But it would cost a million two eighteen, and we only have a million twenty two. Okay, I got that. I'll let you finish what you have because I have more to add on to that. So I think in general, I mean, so this is just really challenging, despite uh, everybody. I don't mean to imply that this isn't great work, and it, yep. it, this is just really a really difficult decision, in my opinion. Um, and I think what makes it what what compounds that for me is if we can't wrap all of this up in the capital article that has been approved is going to be really challenging to go back to town meeting and tell this detailed a story in a way that's digestible and and palatable um, to people at town meeting and so uh, you know uh, that that doesn't really I and mean, we need to address the roof so we need to move forward but i just i think if we can keep that in our mind and be as proactive as possible about reporting this process mm -hmm. and what the what the challenges and parameters were I, I, it's going to be a really high bar to get another capital article for these roofs well i, I don't th i don't think that uh, that you're going to have to do that um well i mean if if in the end what we have yep. to do is what we have here yep. which is over our appropriation yeah, alternates one and two were never part of the appropriation why do we put him in the bid then? But we can't do three because and four. Because he thought that we might, in the event that we had some leftover money. Oh. So he was involved in, in rank, this, these rankings were all, all resultant from these meetings that we had at Town Hall. And we left those meetings saying, we're not going to do uh, this, you know, Band-Aid job at the high school mm -hmm. gymnasium roof. I know, but what so the that's how that ended up on the low end. But there's the confusion here for me, and it sounds like across the board is, it, what part of the roof did we request the appropriation for? Every, everything that's in yellow, and, and the the gymnasium the, and, and the pink at the high school. So which is three and four that we can't do. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I, 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 again, I, the, I think the challenge that we're all I think articulating in different ways here is is so we've locked ourselves off now from being able to do the high school piece because of the order in which we put them in and the ones we put in is al bid alternate one and two were, we're ones that we never had any intention of doing. Well, I think we've locked ourselves in, John, because we, our hands are tied on doing three and four, and we know that that's realistic. We cannot do three and four while we're up against 
um, the company that's not taking responsibility that we stand firm on they caused the damage. But why? So we could have because so, uh, we would have just that would have been part of the damages that we incurred. So I think if, if I don't understand if three and four had been one and two, right. we'd be having a different conversation. I, th I think that's what, right. that's what we're getting at. Yeah, that's what we're, that's yeah. what we're saying. We don't, we don't, as a committee now, have the flexibility to decide whether we want we would want to do the, I see. The, the high school, the alternate three and four, and, and sort of add potentially add on the work we needed to mitigate it to the damages we might seek from BCC because right. we had to do this or the gym would be damaged. We, we procedurally actually can't do it now. You, you cannot award that contract now. However, if you decide that you want to do that, we can create a change order with this bidder with in one time with, frame and get it done when you want it to be done. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it right now. I would do it while they were here. So, what is the time frame that this was? It's going to be done during the summer. This summer. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. why would we bid something that we? feel would I mean to try to replace we couldn't replace that that roof well we could do the repair so again if we think that the, 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 there are legal challenge whatever form it takes with with BCC is going to extend out into the winter into 2017 it's it doesn't it, it doesn't I, I this is again personal opinion I, I don't know that it makes sense to to just basically leave that roof alone and potentially incur more damage in the gym. Right. That's why we're talking about repairs, which but is I thought not the repair, three and four. Are, are the repairs not three and four? No. Yeah. The, yeah. No, wait, no, wait. the no. repairs are. The replacements three that's and four. No replacement. No. So where are the repairs? <laughs> that's what I'm trying. This, this okay. is what I. It, okay. It, okay. Where are the repairs? The repairs are three and four. Right. Right. The, it's not a replacement. Because we can't do a replacement, so we'd have to remove the panels. Right. So repairs right. are sixty-four thousand dollars. Correct. Right up, right in the first paragraph of the memorandum, the removal of the solar panels was never a part of the uh, appropriation. Oh, sorry, that was me. Okay. Oops. That's never been the, the only right. way that we're doing a full replacement is e either with Borrego, uh, BCC's assistance, or with uh, a full appropriation from the town that's going to pay for the solar panels. Right. So our option procedurally and, and as a committee, room. if we say, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to just hold off on repairs to the high school because we know this is going to take a long time and we're going to incur damage to the yeah. gym if we do nothing, is you're saying we can't approve it tonight, but we could approve it in time to get those repairs done in the summer yes. as part of this project. So we're not going to head into a we could we could avoid heading into a school year and or a winter without having those repairs. <clears throat> we just can't do it tonight. That's correct. That's correct. But I think I think we owe it to ourselves to have a conversation with town council before proceeding down that mm -hmm. down that Fair road. Enough. So, so yeah. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. How far into the process do we need to get before we can? start the change order process, which just sounds like the way to switch one and two and well, three and four. Well, the first thing we need to do is sign a contract. Okay. Okay. But I mean, is it, so is it any time after no legal, that or? There's no legal uh, deadlines involved. Okay. So as I, so again, so if, if what we wished had happened is that we had a base bid and then the repairs to the high school, to or the gymnasium roof were one and two. Mm -hmm. We can't, we can't start the bid process over, but after we approve this bid, we can, through a change order process, effectively make that change. Mm -hmm. And then we're reserving one and two for some other day. Well, then you'd have $134,000 to carry instead of the 190, yeah. whatever. Right, so I, I mean, and so as we follow that process along, just like with any other capital project, if there's excess borrowing, mm -hmm. we can return, you know, we can we'll extinguish that. Job, right? You know, again, we will still have a, a challenge if we have to go back to town meeting for anything related to these roofs, because this explanation is gonna be really detailed. <laughs> we can't afford to do, you know, if one and two need to be done in the next five years, 
that could still be a delicate conversation, but that's a problem for a different day. We're not going to solve tonight. So it's so if I'm understanding it correctly now, if we approve this bid, we're approving the entirety of it, or we're approving the base bid? Only the base bid. Okay. And then after we enter into that process, we have the ability through a change order to to reprioritize and move three and four forward only because Greenwood was the low bidder under any scenario okay so that was good yeah. that was a good result so and and so that gives us the ability to let this legal process play itself out a bit mm -hmm. and then we're just gonna have to stay right on top of it mm -hmm. and at some point we may not be able to allow that process to finish we may have to jump in and make repairs to the roof or whatever but mm -hmm. it gives us the flexibility that it sounds like we're all looking for to do it that way did I get that right oh you're, you're on with time. a lot of words you're I think on time. okay all right thank you so is there a reason why we wouldn't go ahead proceeding with the change order now knowing that that's what the school committee is well, going to want us well, to well, I want to ask another question first okay. though because my concern is this I don't remember what the warrant article was for this capital improvement project and whether or not it stated that it was repairs to the high school roof or replacement because there was a protracted discussion about the solar panels so did the warrant article state that we were replacing the gymnasium roof or that we were repairing it because the fact is if we're if we're not replacing it as we stated under the yeah. warrant article are we actually uh, appropriating I, funds appropriately right good question this is happening to well, high school roof repairs at the top of the either way Lori if even if the capital mm -hmm. article said replacement we can't then we can't do it because the mm -hmm. article wasn't worded properly but we can't do it if the, if the article said repair we can't do it without approving this and then doing the change order anyway so no I get so that I, but I'm concerned that it, we're gonna do the repairs it, if it if it okay if I'll make this case that replacing the seams on on a roof is a replacement just because in, in, in people's minds uh, I'm going to replace the roof means that you're going to tear everything off and put everything and put everything new back yeah I don't want to be the one presenting that at town meeting but making that distinction because I think we'll be like yeah I think that that's talking fast and loose and that wasn't the expectation that was set and so I, I feel like we need to be making care. roof repairs is what it said. Okay. It said construction services related to making roof repairs. So we have we so have yeah, some wiggle it, room there. But does that mean that we can't replace the roof? I think one of the other, other, other which is probably yeah. which is probably why we yeah. worded it the Thank way you we for did. Right. That up. I just my concern is is that we are appropriate and, and now I'm also like we we had gotten an estimate when we came up with that number for the roof repairs. Gale Associates mm -hmm. had given us that estimate. Obviously, like we're not ridiculously over it, but you know, prices change, whatever labor changes. So I get why you know we're in this predicament where it may be more expensive than we had the appropriation for. But I also am with Jean on the fact that going back and asking for more money on this project, regardless, is going to be a really mountainous task to do. Um, and so. I get what you're saying about the repair and doing the change order. I don't actually have a problem with that, but the the issue for me is that even even those repairs I think should count as damages against BCC, and and, and right. I think that those weren't discussion so with town council as well. So, to the point about the cost, the appropriation was made up of the base bid mm -hmm. and which was 824 the 64,000 for alternates 3 and 4 and design which is 92 those add up to $980,000 and the appropriation was a million 114 so we're mm -hmm. under the appropriation yeah i guess i still keep coming back for a variety of reasons including the 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 order of yep. the, the alternates okay. I, I don't understand why we put in a bid on a part of the project that wasn't originally conceived of in the Warren article. I mean, I know it's part of the Hopkins yep. roof, but it seems like it wasn't part of the original scope. It's now 
somewhat, I mean, I, I know there's a way around it, but it's somewhat restrictive to us and it pushed us over the total value yeah. of the Warren article. So I, that's the part I'm struggling with too. In, in retrospect, mea culpa. Okay. Seriously. All right. That's, that's fair enough. Yeah. I just, that's, okay. I think originally the discussion had been around replacing the roof around the current solar panels. And in looking at it more carefully, and in, in, in not more carefully, in looking at it more deeply as we began to take on the project and meeting with town council, etc., um, it became apparent that that was not a good solution. Replacing the roof or repairing the roof around the current solar panels in meeting with Gail, who said it could be done, said that would not be the best permanent fix. So I believe that, you know, we've talked about this before, that we are trying to fix a problem based on decisions that were made um, when nobody sitting here, we're, we're sitting here. Including Al. <laughs> and, and we're trying to do it in a way um, that's responsible, but I think what you're struggling with is the, the appropriation, and, 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 and I understand why, in terms of going back, I believe that all the work that's taken place since town meeting 2015 was in response to the reaction on town floor about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the potential for liability. And we've been since trying to push that, that issue with, with a lot of resistance mm -hmm. um, to the point where, you know, are we even going to, is it even worth pursuing this? So uh, we believe that it is, and we believe that the solution of repairing the roof around the current solar panels while we could have done it that way, would not have been the best long-term solution for the town. Right. That the best long-term solution is to insist that the solar panels be, re re -room be removed, that a complete roof re replacement take place, yeah, and then right. some other form of a ballasted system be placed on the roof so that it does not have to include penetrations. Mm -hmm. So I think right. that's where the confusion comes from and where it's not consistent with what w was first being asked from appropriation uh, well, from the from the town. I think you're right. I mean, that's definitely one wild card, but I think the other wild card is is sections one and two or whatever it's called, yeah. the add-on one and two. And so that's okay. It, it it sounds as though that wasn't in the scope of the original estimate that we got from Gail. Mm -hmm. But then, given that we were basically under that, they sort of said, oh, s also by the way like this is on your radar screen for mm -hmm. the not too distant future mm -hmm. and that's what then tipped us over gotcha the appropriation so it's sort of mm -hmm. two different okay. two different wild cards if you will yeah. and and you know it you know they have they are we are where we are and i i but i it sounds like we have a way to manage both yeah. mm -hmm. um yeah. and and i think among other things the critical component to managing it effectively going forward with the town who ultimately we answer to is really clear communication on a very yes. unclear confusing situation yeah. so so to the extent that we can document this really well um, especially because there may be some transition um, mm -hmm. you know by the time this ever comes back again to, to town meeting different people sitting around this table yeah um, so that it's an easy track record for them and, and I think that would have to include the town I mean I think that would have to 100%. be a joint presentation mm -hmm. I, I hope this is also on the Board of Selectmen agenda the way that we're discussing it not that they need to approve I mean I think they already gave us they already voted that we are right this is over the amount where we have to get permission to run our own project from them. We already did that step, I think, Long if I remember ago. correctly. Yeah. yeah, so, but at any rate, they in particular were very interested in um, pursuing what I thought was Borrego and is now BCC um, for, for restitution. So I hope that this is on their agenda and that they're weighing in as well, especially if, you know, things need to be moved forward a little bit more strenuously that would mm -hmm. we would need their support. Mm. So, so now what? <laughs> so, so by, if, can, I, can I take a shot at mapping this out? Sure. So we want to approve the base bid tonight. I think that by sort of consensus a little bit, we want to be in a position to, to act on a potential change order. Obviously, it would require an additional action by the committee. Mm -hmm. And then park alternates one and two 
until we've resolved everything else yeah, and well, it, before we even consider if we want to do anything with yeah, like that. I don't think we're ever going to do right. Okay. alternates one and two with this contract. Okay. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Is there any reason to believe that they wouldn't follow our math of the difference between one, two, three, four, and one, two should be what the change order is? Do you think that they'll? Yeah, they could. It'll be a negotiation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Probably the sooner we get into it with them, the better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, in order to do any of this, we have to yeah. award the Basically. bid to Greenwood. Correct. Okay. And we don't have to specify base one, two, three, four. No, the base bid is eight hundred twenty-four thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other questions? <laughs> okay. So, at this time, I would seek a motion to approve the contract award, which includes the base bid as outlined by Mr. Dumas in the agenda materials. So Second. A motion by Ms. Knight, seconded by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's you know, unanimous and so carries. Okay. We will move on to Thank the you. Kathy <laughs> White Thanks Memorial so. Scholarship. Thanks, Thank you. Even you look out. at his blueprints. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you want to show us all those? He brought props. Well, Mr. Doom, Mr. Fine Doom, and Google Earth. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so we're moving on to the Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship, Dr. McLeod. This is an annual scholarship um, that's awarded at uh, senior awards night um, and this particular one uh, needs your approval in order to appropriate the funds from the town. So it's different from you know most of them that we don't have to go through the town for. <laughs> so it, it's um, for your consideration. Um, we hope that you will approve it because uh, the awards night is on June the 1st. <laughs> <laughs> no Somebody is going to be receiving it. Questions? Okay. I would seek a motion to authorize payment of the Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship in the amount of $500. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Kavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous yes. and so yes. All right. There is no old business tonight, and we now are at our second opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone that would like to speak? Um, there's no one here interested in speaking at this time, so we are going to move on to items by consensus. Dr. McLeod. The superintendent recommends a school committee vote to approve the operating budget and other funds warrant number 16-065 in the amount of $336,373.25. The superintendent recommends a school committee vote to approve the high school student war activities warrant number 16-066 in the amount of $8,652.75. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the Hopkins School Student Activities Warrant number 16-067 in the amount of $900. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the Elmwood School Student Activities Warrant number 16-068 in the amount of $1,893.66. The superintendent recommends a school committee vote to approve $500 from Target's Take Charge of Education and $403.60 from Box Tops for Education fundraiser programs to be placed in the center school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve $1,000 from Target's Take Charge of Education fundraiser program to be placed in the Elmwood School gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends a school committee vote to approve $1,100 from Target's Take Charge of Education fundraiser program to be placed in the high school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends a school committee vote to approve $700 from Target's Take Charge of Education fundraiser program to be placed in the middle school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. And I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. And our next, well, our definitive <laughs> next meeting is 
Thursday, June 16th at 7 p.m. in the middle school library. There may be a meeting that will be posted for June 2nd, 2016, once we've confirmed June calendars. Confirmed yeah. By, by Tuesday. And the meeting on June 30th is no longer occurring. Correct. Great. Thank you and good night.